Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the March 18th Select Board meeting. This meeting is called to order at 6.30. And before we get started with public comment, I would like to note that Alan Torrey, the town's first town manager, passed away on March 7th of uh, just a couple of weeks ago. He served as Amherst Town's manager from 1954 to 1975. And uh, just in honor of Alan Torrey, I'd like to take a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Mr. Musanti, would you like to say a few words about Mr. Torrey? Yeah, I would. A number of us uh, uh, had the honor of attending um, the funeral services for Alan Torrey on, on Saturday. and. Um, looking back through his years of service with the town, uh, back in 1974 when Alan was celebrating his 20th year of service with the town as its first town manager, there was a town meeting proclamation that characterized Alan Torrey as, quote, dedicated, thorough, impartial, knowledgeable, and professional with the highest standards of uh, ethics. And Alan, uh, after uh, uh, leaving the role of town manager and, and serving as treasurer at Hampshire College, uh, returned to town service back in 1983 and served two, ter two terms on the Amherst Select Board. Um, and uh, uh, Barry Del Castillo, former town manager, was one of the speakers at the service and talked about Alan's service uh, to his community and to his his church, to uh, Hampshire College, to the South Amherst community. Uh, he also talked about the many lunches he had over the years with Alan and, you know, and talking with staff and reminiscing. Uh, that was the first time I met Alan Torrey, was at a lunch mm -hmm. with uh, Barry Del Castillo. And it was really uh, going through a laundry list of town issues and it was a mini history lesson having the uh, opportunity to speak with Alan and so, um, um, he was a real leader in our community and I joined many others in mourning his passing and uh, uh, thanking him for his, his decades of service to the community. Thank you very much. Someone who really very literally helped make Amherst what it is today. So thank you. Okay, uh, public comment. How many folks do we have here for public comment? Okay, Mr. Weiss. Please introduce yourself for folks at home. I'm Jerry Weiss from Precinct 8. Uh, for, thank you for recognizing me. Um, I'm glad to see you all up there. I'm reminded every <laughs> time I come, <laughs> I'm thankful that you're up there and not me. Um, it's my understanding that sometime this year, uh, Rolling Green Apartments will cease to be considered low-income housing units um, that they have been for I don't know how many years um, and that they make up a fairly large number of our units and that when they go what we call I think it's called offline meaning they'll become more private um, market rate units um, when that happens, the town will go below the 10% threshold that the state requires to avoid having developers come in and be able to put up <coughs> kind of what they want. They can ignore a lot of zoning laws as long as they provide a certain number of uh, um, low-income units, probably 10%. They probably have to provide at least 10%. Um, and so th that's my understanding and that that means that that developers can pretty much do what they want if they own a piece of land and we've always avoided that because we've been above 10 percent for many many years and because of that right because of that number above 10 percent they couldn't do that they had to actually get permission from the select board to do it <coughs> so i would love if the select board would hold a public, make this a, um, an item, a scheduled item in the near future, invite a member of the planning department, a member of the housing committee, and have an open discussion 
so the community can hear all that's going on, what it means to the community, what are, is anything gonna be done about this 10% problem? Uh, are we to, or should we expect developers coming in and buying up some land and putting up large buildings? Um, I think the community would like to, I would like to know, and I'm guessing a lot of the community would like to know what is all this gonna mean and when would it mean that? So I'd love to see that be a scheduled item. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming in. And next, ma'am. Please identify yourself for Hello, folks. I'm Karen Jones. I'm a previous resident of Amherst for many years. I was a town meeting member, a member of the Parking Commission, <coughs> Public Transportation and Bicycle Committee. And I'm here before you as a member of the Planning Committee for the Bike Week celebration. It will happen in May from the Monday the 13th to the 17th Friday. And our request to you is to be able to reserve the use of the Main Street parking lot on Friday for our breakfast, which we've had for, I guess, 14 years now. And uh, the Spring Street lot on Wednesday for the rodeo, which will be available for registration by, high s by elementary school kids in conjunction with leisure services after school program. Um, we do things all week, Monday through Friday, and these are the two that require use of space. Thank you, so that is uh, on our agenda to deal with that tonight, so we do have a motion for that. Um, but while you're here, is there anything else you'd like to say about the Bike Week activities, kind of give folks a commercial? all members of the community. We welcome uh, veteran mm. bicyclists, um, uh, infrequent bicyclist and newbie bicyclists. <coughs> we want to support people who want to get on a bike uh, from all ages, you know, young to old. We're working with the senior center and uh, the health department this year to see if we can get some elders on in the saddle. And where can folks learn more about there the upcoming events? There will be um, information posted. Where this is a part of an, act, uh, an initiative that's statewide that's done with the Mass Dot. And um, that's called baystatebikeweek.org is where you can get information, baystatebikeweek.org. State, Bay and then massbikepv, all one word, dot org, uh, gives a calendar of events in the Pioneer Valley. And the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission plays a major role in helping all this happen. Terrific. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Um, is anybody else here for public comment for something that's not on the agenda? Okay, then we might as well take care of the Bike Week uh, uh, motions right now. Well, Ms. Jones is here, so she can leave satisfied we have done this correctly. Ms. Stein. <laughs> I move that the Select Board approve the reservation of all metered parking spaces in the Spring Street parking lot on Wednesday, May 15, 2013, from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. for a bike rodeo. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> aye. That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve the reservation of all metered parking spaces in the Main Street parking lot on Friday, May 17, 2013, from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. for the annual bike breakfast and bike show. Second. Further discussion? Mr. Hayden. Um, it, it turns out that I'm too old to join the rodeo, but it looks like it's a lot of fun on Wednesday. But the Friday, I am allowed to participate in the events on Friday, and those are also, um, it's a great deal to come and not only get breakfast, but to meet your fellow bicyclers, learn their stories, and uh, I'm hopeful that there'll be the, uh, the fun contraptions to try out. There are all different kinds of bicycles that often show up there, so. Terrific. Thank you very much. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in, and we will look forward to Bike Week. All right, we've still got six minutes before our first timed item, so let's see if we can take care of a couple of untimed items. We do have other uh, parking reservations. Ms. Stein. I move that the select board approve the reservation of the first eight meter parking spaces on the west side of Boltwood Avenue, or originating at Spring Street, moving south toward College Street, beginning Saturday, May 4th, 2013, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. and the reservation of the first four meter parking spaces on the west side of Boltwood Avenue, originating at Spring Street, 
moving south toward College Street and the reservation of the first four metered parking spaces on the south side <coughs> of the Spring Street parking lot beginning at the Boltwood Street entrance from Thursday, May 2nd, 2013 at 8 a.m. through Friday, May 3rd, 2013 to 6 p.m. and again on Saturday, May 4th, 2013 beginning at 2 p.m. through Sunday, May 5th, 2013 at 6 p.m. for the Amherst League of Women Voters annual book sale. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Hayden. This looks an awful lot like the reservation we um, handled last year and the year before that and the year before that. Um, I guess the season is starting for activities on the town common and uh, this is a good one raising um, as it does funds for the League of Women Voters. Thank it you. actually is the major source of funding for the local League of Women Voters. Very important. We have gotten this motion down pat after all of these years. Yes, so. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Much detail was put into that. Okay, further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Another one. Um, the liquor license? Sure. Oh, no, we can't do that yet. You can do the Florence Savings Bank parking one below okay. the bike week. Yes, I can do that. I move that the select board approve the reservation of four metered parking spaces in front of 98 North Pleasant Street and Super Bowl on the west side of North Pleasant Street on March 22, 2013 at a cost of $5 per meter per day for the installation of a replacement ATM. Um, that's for Florence Bank and maybe it should say that. 26? Mm-hmm. March yes. 26th. Is that not A correct? Week hence? You read 22nd. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about that. But yes, because <coughs> I was distracted by the fact that the motion should say for Florence Savings Bank as part of the motion, I think. Okay. Um, Mr. Hayden, have you seconded the motion? I have seconded it. Thank you, Ms. Brewer. Yes. Um, beyond what Ms. Stein just pointed out about saying who was responsible, um, the party that's Could doing speak for Florence mind? Savings Bank. Um, I would just like us to reassure the public what I think is true, which is that the ops, once we approve this, the office will let Super Bowl and the adjacent oh, yeah. business know about it just so they're not horribly surprised when they show up in case the bank people didn't think to tell them ahead of time. <laughs> Thank you. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Aye, that's unanimous. A couple more minutes, uh, so let's try some special liquor licenses. I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license for the Friends of the Jones Library wine tasting fundraiser to be held in the Jones Library on Saturday, March 23rd, 2013 from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Bonnie Isman, president. Actually, I think you've got an old motion sheet because the new motion <laughs> sheet has no, that one struck. That's been... Um, no, we struck the one from Eisenberg, I thought. Oh, well, that event has been um, um, postponed well. until the fall, so... Okay, that's funny. also that's off. My okay. yeah. It just didn't make it to the update. All right. Shall I take the second one down? Is Which is what? Just for... <laughs> oh, um, all, let's see. That's Margarita for the Eric... testing. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Am I reading in the right place? No, I you're in the right place. We're on yeah, the same yeah. okay. So it should be the Eric Carl Museum... Uh, wine, yes, yeah, okay, yep, Margar so margarita. It was just it the still first says one. testing, even though I called and said it's tasting. <laughs> <laughs> Makes okay. it sound very scientific. The wheels are falling off. I, <laughs> I'm sorry, but we don't test the margaritas, we test them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will be noted this. on the minutes. <laughs> okay, good. I move that the select board approve a special all alcohol license for the Amherst Chamber of Commerce Margarita Tasting at the Eric Hall Museum on March 27, 2013 from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Joan Temkin, Marketing Director. Tomato, tomato. Second. Further discussion? Ms. Brewer. If we could just correct Joan's last name in the uh, minutes, that'd be helpful. Yeah, Take the oh yeah. P out. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. All right, that's all we're going to do for now. We're going to do our 645 okay. item. Thank you very much. And we'll have those to fill in later. So our 645 item is uh, statements of interest from Mass School Building Authority. This is something we do every couple of years. This is uh, we need to 
be part of the process um, <coughs> to get on the state's list for potentially signing uh, for potentially financing <coughs> new school construction or renovation. So we have Mr. Bahanowitz and Ms. Garrick here to talk to us about the letters. Uh, we haven't done this. I can't remember if we did it last year. We don't do it every year. But um, the last time we did it, we said, you know what? These letters are kind of confusing, and it would be nice to have folks here to tell us what they're talking about. So We'd here be you happy are. To do Thank that. you. <laughs> Uh, so I will speak to um, kind of the educational um, goals of what we're hoping to receive if we are chosen to receive funds from the, the building authority. Um, so we are, and we brought this motion to the Amherst Schools um, Committee on Tuesday, last Tuesday and they voted to support both statements of interest. And this would be for uh, Fort River Elementary School and Wildwood Elementary School. And our hope would be to um, renovate both of the buildings. Um, I'll speak about the educational piece and <coughs> we can talk about the, the infrastructure and things that I won't know how to cover. So in terms of the educational um, structure, for those of you who have been in, in both of those buildings, um, while they are on, to some standard really fine buildings, they're not really created to be conducive to educating um, students today. Um, I know that there must have been a great reason to have open air classrooms um, <laughs> many, many years ago, but today to have um, in three to four classrooms in one space where there are partial walls um, that go up so the noise from four classrooms are within that space is challenging. Also, um, when students are walking from one part of the quad um, <coughs> To, an, to use the bathroom, they walk through each other's classrooms. So it's not how today, if we were going to look at how to design the interior of a school, just from the classroom perspective alone, um, would not be, this would not be our first choice. Um, in addition, there are um, needs today that when you have specific populations of students, you wanna have smaller breakout spaces where you're working with students in small groups. Um, we have less opportunity for that type of instruction unless we're kind of walking with kids across the building. So you lose instructional time through um, movement throughout the building. So those are kind of the, the larger, like the educational implications. And I know Ron can speak to many, many um, more in terms of safety as well as the structures. Let me just give you a little bit too about the, uh, what they call the SOI, the Statement of Interest. It's the MSBA, which is the Massachusetts School Building Association. Uh, this process is something that they did a while back ago to expedite um, the selection of schools that are in need of renovations, repairs, or, or new schools being built. Previously, what would happen is the people like ourselves would go off, we'd hire an architect, we'd spend all kinds of money, and then we would go out and say, hey, we want to build a school. Will the state give us some funding? And sometimes you got on the list and sometimes you didn't. And in the meantime, the towns actually spent lots of money under engineering and that kind of stuff. This process now, what we do is we submit to them, we're interested in moving forward. And if we move forward, will you play in the game with us? <clears throat> and if they then invite us into the game, then we can start moving down that road of, of, um, of the designs and what we're gonna actually do. So the first thing we have to do is we have to get a vote from the school committee. And then w and when it's a town building, you have to also get the select board or if it's a city, the mayor or whoever else to uh, say that they're willing to support this. And what we're really, there isn't any real monetary commitment when we uh, vote tonight, but what is there is you are serious that we're gonna, if we were chosen, we're really serious about moving forward. And that's kind of what we're really voting on. Along with what uh, Maria had spoken about with the schools, there's also a couple of things that are really new <coughs> that have prop popped up in the ra last few years, and that's the security of the schools. Uh, these schools, again, with this four open area, uh, any type of entry into the school, automatically you have four classrooms that you can get into in a, in, in a second. Our main office is literally 80 feet or 100 feet away from the doors. Uh, and before you even get to the main office, there's hallways that you can go down, and then there's also rooms that are just off of those main hallways. Additionally, the school, uh, the one thing the town has done is <coughs> has maintained the school fairly well. Uh, I have written this SOI since 2008. I submitted an eight, nine, and I think 10. In 11, I sent one for the uh, middle school windows uh, and we were fortunate enough to get invited in on the windows 
Uh, they, they reimbursed us at 60 cents on a dollar. And this year, actually, what we are asking for is we're asking mm -hmm. for Wildwood, Fort River, and I actually wrote one for the high school, uh, for new boilers at the high school mm -hmm. under their green, under their green uh, SOI. And <clears throat> that only had to be voted by the regional school committee and then signed by Maria to submit. And so we're submitting that as well, and I'm hoping that we're going to get that money as, as in addition. So uh, it's a long way in front of us, but part of the process is to come here tonight and get your vote uh, that you were willing to support uh, moving forward on this. Thank you very much. That was an excellent explanation and much appreciated. Uh, questions or comments from select board members? <coughs> Ms. Boer. Um, as I always like to point out when we do this statement, one of the things that, you know, and you've explained the process super well, but for people who are looking at it online and just looking at the statement of interest, sometimes the categories sound kind of scary, and, and you should not be afraid to send your children to school. <laughs> the buildings are not falling in. Nothing's, you know, the furnace isn't failing, any of those things. Unfortunately, those things are happening in other parts of the state, which is why so many people are ahead of us in line. But... But we, we fit within these categories. It just doesn't mean that it's <coughs> like scary. So I just like to reassure people. And, and that, that, is, that is true. And just as a, you know, again, for the public, there's 1,800 schools in the state of Massachusetts. And of those 1,800, there's many, many people looking to go into this process. And as a matter of fact, if you went onto the Massachusetts School Building Authority's website, you can actually see where all the projects are. There's a graphic representation oh, nice. of where they are, and it's pretty interesting. Thank you. Ms. Stein. Um, however, uh, we, one of the repairs that's needed that's before JCPC is for a $400,000 boiler, boiler um, work for the Wildwood School. So we're talking about some very serious expenditures that need to be made, um, and that's one of the categories that the MSBA looks at is um, <clears throat> boilers and energy. And so it'd be wonderful if we could, in fact, get some money to help with these. Thank you. So would that money, in fact, help, or is that JCPC is uh, a separate process for this? Well, the JCPC, the 400000 that we're asking for for the JCPC is to retrofit the boilers that are existing, uh, what we call number two fuel oil, also known as just regular home heating oil. And uh, we're going to retrofit those with, and they were from 1973, we're going to retrofit them with um, natural gas, high efficiency boilers. Uh, I did that at Fort River, I think it's two years now. And I just did a, I was doing some numbers today. And uh, Fort River last year, we spent um, $29,000 in natural gas, whereas Wildwood last year, we spent $108,000 in oil. So I'm predicting that if we move forward with the $400,000, we're going to have a sixty dollars or $70,000 per year uh, payback on it. And in addition to that, we're not only getting the, the economies of the commodity pricing, but what we're also getting is the efficiency of going from something like the, the high 70s up to the 90s in efficiency. And then also, uh, I'm, I'm big, I love energy and I love the, the <laughs> community, but um, it also really helps us from the uh, carbon footprint as well because the natural gas is much less uh, carbon output than the fuel oil. That's tremendous. So that, that none of that is dependent on the MSBA No, funding. but what, what I can say is what we do with the boiler will be usable in the future. Uh -huh. uh, so it's not like it's throwaway money. Right, thank you. Ms. Stein. Also, I'm remembering that we did roof repairs to Wildwood a long time ago, or quite a while ago, and then got reimbursed. Is that a possibility with this boiler retrofit? Uh, no, because one of the things right now is uh, there's the green energy thing that I talked about at the high school. Right. That's uh, under the MSBA. If you only need one thing, you need a, a roof okay. or a boiler or windows one thing they'll fund that under the green repair if you need like wildwood because of the infrastructure with the classrooms and everything else they're going to either fund the whole project <coughs> or they're not going to fund any of it at all okay thank you thank you other questions or comments for these folks anyone in the public questions or comments okay 
Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Okay, and I am to read all of this. If you would please. In uh, your special way, yes. <laughs> okay, I just want to be sure because <laughs> it is rather lengthy. Yes, it is. Um, having convened in an open meeting on March 18, 2013, the Amherst Select Board, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the Statement of Interest Form dated 2013 for the Fort River Elementary School located at 70 Southeast Street, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. One, replacement or renovation of a building which is structurally unsound or otherwise in a condition seriously jeopardizing the health and safety of school children where no alternative exists. Two, elimination of existing severe overcrowding. Three, prevention of severe overcrowding expected to result from increased enrollment. Four, replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating, and ventilation systems to increase mm -hmm. energy conservation and decrease energy-related costs in a school facility. Five, short-term enrollment growth. Six, replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings <clears throat> in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with, this, with state and approved local requirements, <clears throat> and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits the city slash town slash regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. One more. Okay. <laughs> having convened in an open, this is going to be very boring, but <laughs> <laughs> having convened in an open meeting on March 18th, 2013, the Amherst Select Board, in accordance with its <coughs> charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the Statement of Interest Form dated 2013 for the Wildwood Elementary School located at 71 Strong Street, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and per, per, <laughs> priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. One, replacement or renovation of a building which is structurally unsound or otherwise in a condition seriously jeopardizing the health and safety of school children where no alternative exists. Two, elimination of existing severe overcrowding. Three, prevention of severe overcrowding expected to result from increased enrollments. Four, replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility <coughs> systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decrease energy-related costs in a school facility. Four, short-term enrollment growth. Five, replacement of or in addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements. And hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits the city <coughs> slash town slash regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. Clearly this is a result of the Full Employment for Select Boards Act that we have to read all of this. <laughs> right. But also I, I guess the form is important to be clear about what it is we're doing. 
even though that, that is pretty rote. I mean, clearly we're only going to pick one or two or three of those seven items. So. All right. and so that's exactly why Ms. Brewer in particular um, had requested that y you folks come in and explain this because otherwise we're sitting here going, we don't know what we're talking about. Are the, are the buildings falling down? You know, is there extreme overcrowding or whatever? Um, so that's very helpful. So much appreciated. Ms. Stein. Okay, so I'm really old, but I remember when that school was new, <laughs> Wildwood, and my kids went to England after their first year there and bragged about the carpeting on the floor <laughs> and this wonderful space that they had. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard for, and I remember when they put up the totem pole, which was done by the students. Still and there. it's hard to believe <laughs> that it's really so different. Um, but I've seen it since, so I know that it desperately <coughs> needs this work. So I hope you get the money. Further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you very much for coming in. Really yes, appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. And can I say, I don't sure. know why people put carpets in elementary schools, in particular in the cafeterias. <laughs> it was supposed to make it quiet. Right. No, it's supposed to make it quiet I, so I you could understand. handle yeah. all that <laughs> open space. So mm -hmm. thank you very, very much. Thank you very tonight. much. Appreciate you coming in. Okay, 655 item. This is a liquor license change. This is a change of manager for Thai Corner. Um, and we ha had established quite a while ago that when, uh, when the liquor license change does not require a public hearing, we don't make anybody come in for it. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked many times about how the liquor licenses are so incredibly specific that any change to them um, needs to come before the select board, but only changes at a certain level require an actual public hearing on that. So a change of manager does not require a public hearing, but I want to make sure nobody's here to speak to that at all. Okay, um, so Ms. Stein, would you like to make that motion? Sure, there, there's two motions Both under, okay, yes. just to make sure. But one's in yellow, and I didn't know if that was. Uh, that's part of the revised motion okay, sheet, so fine. That's, that's a good thing. I move <coughs> that the select board approve a change of manager from Chet Setion Pak to Kanit Bunag for Thai Corner Incorporated doing business as Thai Corner Restaurant ABCC license number 024000090-11. Second. Further discussion. Ms. Brewer. I just wanted to also mention quickly to follow up what you said. The, the select board town manager office does such a fabulous job on these things for us. I mean, anybody who looks at this stuff online, there was an additional piece of paper tonight. It's just tons of paperwork from ABCC. We look at it, we're like, whatever. I mean, it's just so <laughs> rote. But the police chief does look at it. That's why the change of manager has to be looked at. So there are. it, it may seem like we're not doing much because we're not but we have to do that part, but the office behind us and the police chief behind us are doing all their parts to make sure this all works appropriately. So we aren't just killing trees for no reason, just so you know. That's a good point. Uh, we, are, we are the end of the line in this. There's plenty of process before it gets to us. Mr. Hayden. And we appreciate it. Indeed. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve the new officers slash directors as presented in the petition for transfer of ownership dated March 18, 2013 for Thai Corner Incorporated doing business as Thai Corner <coughs> Restaurant, ABCC license number 024000090-11. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Timing is good. Uh, all right. So our next item then is the FY14 budget discussion on the 2013 paving and road work plan. And uh, we have Mr. Zeki from uh, Department of Public Works here to talk to us about this. Um, for folks following along at home, per usual, we have all this information in our web packets. And uh, welcome. Please introduce yourself for folks at home. Oh, thank you. Well, yes, I'm Mr. Zeki, and I will applaud you for pronouncing it right, because most people don't, so that's impressive. Um, but I'm the assistant superintendent of public works, so since Guilford is not available tonight, I get to present this to you. So um, do you want to? Uh, yeah, just very briefly before Amy uh, walks you through, there is a worksheet in your packet that's posted online that has a, has a, uh, our current list of construction activity by Public Works 
uh, for 2013 that she can run through in detail. And uh, Steve Braun is also here from chair of the Public Works Committee. Uh, they've been working very closely with staff, uh, assisting with the development of prioritized recommendations, and uh, we've had a number of discussions. It's been very, very helpful. Um, so Amy will run through the list, uh, and it, it continues progress, uh, but the, and which is good, but the, the, the tough thing that people throughout town and throughout the state know is that the list of uh, projects that need to be done, streets that need to be paved, uh, uh, sidewalks, et cetera, is very, very long. In fact, in Amherst, we have about a $16 million uh, backlog. Uh, there's roughly a million and a half dollars in available funding for the coming year. So we have a long ways to go, and it just underscores uh, that as we consider this in the sequencing of, of projects, uh, it's very, very important that the state uh, of Massachusetts and the legislature uh, provide cities and towns with the resources we need to maintain and, and rehabilitate our roads. Uh, there was a, a transportation finance bill uh, that's been filed uh, in the legislature. The House is actively considering it uh, presently. Uh, we are very hopeful there will be action by the House of Representatives during the month of April uh, that would, uh, could potentially, if the governor's proposal is adopted, um, allow our Chapter 90 road grant to be increased by 50%. It would go from about 800,000 a year to about $1.2 million a year. You know, so that's, and with a 10-year commitment with, with increases over that time for inflation, um, that would allow us uh, to address the majority of that list. Uh, and my intention would be to, if we really did get a 10-year commitment uh, from the legislature at that amount, would be to bond uh, a large portion of that Chapter 90 money so we could, we could do the work over the next uh, two to three construction seasons and see the benefit of those improvements at less cost uh, than waiting a full 10 years. But that's uh, a debate that's very active now in the legislature. Uh, they're talking about how to, the, the, the easy part is arriving at consensus for the needs. The hard part is uh, getting agreement on a, a uh, tax source uh, to pay for it. A broad-based tax is critical. Uh, there's been discussions about some combination of sales and income tax, uh, income tax, um, and that's, I think it's important that we, we've let the, uh, legislators know and, and Transportation Secretary Davey and the governor that we're supporting his efforts. And April really is a critical time to bring this thing to the finish line so we can begin to make real meaningful progress against our entire list. So with that, I'll. Thank you. Tell us the details. Okay. Um, well, you guys have your list in front of you. <coughs> um, so I guess I'd, I don't know how much detail you guys want specifically. Um, we have we have it kind of broken down in terms of funding sources for these. So under uh, the bond funding, we're looking at Strong Street, um, Northeast Street to East Pleasant Street. Uh, there's probably going to be a little bit of sidewalk work there as well. Um, then we have Triangle Street also under that same bond issue uh, from Main Street to Old North Pleasant Street. And again, there'll, there'll be a little bit of side work, sidewalk work with that. Um, both of those are going to be reclaimed. Uh, for Chapter 90 work, uh, we have Lincoln Ave, which, uh, as you guys probably know, we've been doing the sewer work, so that'll be uh, base coat, coat only this year, and then hopefully top coat next year. And then we have uh, West Street uh, to be done, um, and that's just going to be a small section of West Street, and I know if you look at the, uh, the price tag on that, it looks like a lot of price for a small amount of length. Um, that involves some uh, regrading. Right now, the, there's a short section there that um, there's not good sight, especially if you're pulling in and out of the red barn. Uh, so this is the section right in front of the red barn. So there's going to be some lowering of the road to improve the, um, the sight on that. Um, 
there's a little bit of water work there as well because we'll be lowering the road so the water main will have to be <coughs> moved as well. Um, and then Dana Street, uh, putting in the speed humps on Dana Street is the last, um, last item under Chapter 90 funding. Under our sewer fund, uh, we're going to be looking at repaving the section of Cherry Lane that we replaced the sewer main in last year. Um, so, and that's going to be getting the top course. It got the mm. base course last year. Um, and then a couple of other, I guess, miscellaneous projects. Uh, we're going to be doing the middle school tennis courts. We're going to be doing the site prep, the reclaiming, and the regrading, and then the school is going to be taking care of um, the fencing and the painting and the other associated work. And then uh, we've got, we have Cottage Street, which we will be um, doing the top, cor uh, the top course on. Um, and depending on what version of this you got, um, I don't know if you got Cottage Street from Triangle Street to, we have number 36 Triangle Street. Um, it should be the entire length of that, but we are, um, we are at this point trying to figure out what exactly we're going to do. Um, the town engineer is working on a focus group with some residents there to try and figure out so that the design isn't quite done on that, but it is our intention to try to do the whole road, to come with a consensus with the, the residents there. So, um, so those are the, the actual paving projects, and then the second part of the sheet there is the other projects that we're going to have that are going to have some effect on the roadways um, but don't necessarily involve paving this year. Um, I don't know if you want me to run through those or not. Um, uh, sure, why don't you why don't you do just sort of a brief overview brief of those overview. also. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, so for water projects this year, we have um, Centennial, the, the next phase. Last year, the phase was to put the sewer main down um, Amherst Road and Pelham Road. This year, the phase two of that is to replace the pump station, which is in front of the Pelham Police Fire Station right there. Um, the pump station there is, um, it's in rough shape. So we're gonna be replacing that um, as kind of phase two for the centennial work. And then um, we're replacing a water main on Hillcrest Ave um, due to water quality issues there. And then on Old Town Road and Moreland Street, um, we're replacing some water main there for um, to incre increase the water main capacity there and also to, um, I guess, to loop a couple of dead ends there so we don't have um, dead ends, which are typical water quality uh, issues. So, um, so that's the work that we're doing. Um, the Hillcrest, Old Town, and Moreland Street, those three projects we're going to be doing in-house. Our crews will be doing that. And then the pump station work, we do have a contractor for that. Sewer projects, um, Larkspur, Wood <coughs> uh, Wildflower, Lady Slipper, T-Berry Lane, Wood, uh, Woodlot Road. Those are all part of the sewer expansion project. Um, we are putting together a bid for that to go out to get a contractor to do that work. Uh, so those are the sewer projects. And then water and sewer. It's Harkness Road, um, which again, that's part of our sewer expansion project that's you know this year's portion of that and then uh, Pine Street uh, I guess pending mm -hmm. town um, town meeting approval um, of the bonds for that we will be doing both water mm -hmm. and sewer replacement on Pine Street so thank you very I'll take much any questions <laughs> okay so I'm sure select board will have um, plenty of questions and then we'll get to um, the uh, Chair of the Public Works Committee, if you'd like to comment, and I know there's a bunch of folks from the public would like to comment also. So uh, starting with questions and comments from Select Board on any of these items, what is and isn't on the list? <coughs> Mr. Hayden, and sorry. There, there well, um, I actually brought the, the list of projects that I was given at the last Public Works Committee meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of stuff that's not on the list, and I just wanted to uh, be appreciative of the committee for their aid in prioritizing that, you know, sort of getting to the what what is uh, uh, perceived what what are the top problems. Um, I it, it's a, it was a very long conversation and very thoughtful, and um, I'm glad for it because it does give us get get us to this point where we can say, yeah, this is this is a good list. Thank you, Ms. Brewer. That's excellent, and I'm sorry if you already mentioned this. You did such a great overview, but maybe I missed it. When you're talking, and it's in my neighborhood, so that's why I have to ask. <laughs> Under the water section, 
Yep. Um, old, old Town and Moreland, and of course I want to know for Hillcrest anyway too. Um, when we do that work, then because of the staging of the, of the previous projects, so we'll do the water main work this year, then obviously that will tear up the road. So yes. then does the road get done the same year or does it get done the following year? Just so that I can tell people when they yell at me. Right. <laughs> have them call us, and <laughs> but um, typically what we'll do is when we finish that work, we will at least patch it. We do try and get a base course down that year if we can, but um, you never get perfect compaction right. when you do it, so you wanna wait at least a That's year until I you do the top the course, just so that right. it saves a lot it in, in pavement quality if we can wait that year. Excellent. Um, and that's why you'll see some of um, you know, Cherry Lane and Cottage Street are both places where we did the work last year and right. got the base course. Now we'll do the top course now that it's settled. Exactly, and of course these are much less traveled than those are, and so, um, but just to let people know, no, it's not gonna stay that way. Exactly. <laughs> it will be fixed the following year. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Mr. Hayden. It's just another, it's, a, it's kind of a subtle one. You mentioned the looping of mains. Mm -hmm. um, as I understand that, that's a, a small additional cost. Those are not long pieces that connect the ends of those together so it loops through. But it is really good practice and I appreciate that, that, that we're actually putting it into practice here. It, it, it helps a lot. Yeah. Thank the you. water quality is fine. Other questions or comments from Select Board? Uh, what can you tell us about Pine Street? So what's the, what's the general status of Pine Street, which has to be the most complained about road in town? <laughs> yes, we certainly get our share of complaints as well. So um, I, I, as far as I know, we've just been waiting to get fun, you know, for the last several years, we've been hoping to get you know, state grants or something to be <coughs> able to do that work. Um, but there was, as with a lot of these ones, you wanna fix what's under the road before you actually do the road. Um, <coughs> I believe we applied for funding again this year and did not get it. So we're, that's why, at least through the water and sewer fund, we're gonna move forward with <coughs> replacing the infrastructure um, because we can't continue to wait for outside funding for that. Um, the engineers are working because we understand that there's a lot of questions about if we do um, traffic improvements at certain intersections. So our engineers are busy looking at different options and I'm sure they'll be presenting <coughs> that to you guys as they come up with different selections. Um, so that's still very much in the, um, in the process. So, so I believe there's plans on the Public Works website for um, different options that we're looking at there. So. Thank you. So the, uh, the water and sewer lines will be replaced, which means tearing up the road pretty significantly yes. anyway. So once that's done, no matter what you put over, it's gonna be an improvement over <laughs> currently, right? <laughs> So, it, I mean, is that true? Does it does it really kind of rip up the whole road surface, or is it just going to be? It's it's going to rip it up pretty good, um, but we will be. It, you notice? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you may or may not notice, and at least you know a year from now, it's going to be a great road, and it's going to be great. The infrastructure underneath, you know, the water main will be the right size, um, <coughs> the sewer main will be the right size to be mm -hmm. able to handle um, everything that we put down it from Atkins treatment. That's part of what's overwhelming that sewer main right now anyway, so. Um, um, in a year. <laughs> and is this, uh, this whole list, not just the sewer part, but all of it, um, is this more or less in the order it's expected to go, or how does that work? Not necessarily in the order. Um, we, um, <coughs> in terms of the work that we do, um, the guys are gonna do it in order of when they can get materials and what makes sense. Um, in terms of the paving, um, just a little note on timeline, we are working on the bid to put the bid out. Um, hopefully by middle of April, we'll have um, the bids in from the contractors, so they should be able to start pretty quickly after that. And then we're gonna try and, um, if we can sneak in stuff like Triangle Street before graduation, that would be great. Otherwise, we'll wait till the kids are out of school. Like those are the sort of things that help us prioritize when these actually happen is when other activities are going on that we have to work around. <coughs> and is the um, is that whole bidding process is that is that on track for what you <coughs> expected? Like we talked about um, bonding in the fall in order to get an early start on this year's paving process instead of having to wait until after Springtown meetings. That was that's. I think overall it is, and we're expecting competitive bids to come in in mid-April. 
and people will be wondering about um, pothole filling in these various places in the meantime. Are you, you're not going to ignore the roads that are on the list or anything like that, right? No. Um, right now we're a little disadvantaged. We have a big stack of potholes and our reclaimer is uh, getting some repairs over the last week. So if people are a little frustrated with pothole filling right now, it's, we'll be back on track in a couple of days. But yeah. that is a concern, we know. Other questions or comments from select board? Um, one other question. Um, so Dana Street speed humps, this is something that we've heard a lot from um, members of that, uh, those Dana and Blue Hills neighborhoods about and also from Public Works Committee in their original recommendation to us. Um, the concern is since the roads are, are parallel and sort of, uh, you know, people might use one versus the other. If we only do the speed humps on one street, what does that mean? So w what's the rationale behind that plan? The rationale behind doing Dana Street and not Blue Hills is just that the, the pavement on Blue Hills is, it's in rough enough shape that the speed humps, uh, it, it would be hard to actually secure them to the road, essentially. Um, you, you basically don't want to put speed humps on until you have a, a good enough surface to be able to put them over. Um, so until Blue Hills can make it onto the priority list of roads to be paved, um, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that it be done. Um, we do also, another hitch in that whole thing is that there are a couple of water quality issues on Blue Hills that we're in the process of having studied, but we don't quite know the answer. And again, you don't want to repave a road until you make sure what's underneath it is taken care of. So, you know, it's on our radar, but not necessarily for this year. Okay. All right. I'm sure there will be more comment about that. Um, other questions or comments from select board? All right. Um, so, uh, Mr. Brown, would you like to talk to us about public I'm works here, committee stuff? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so then, the public folks want to comment on anything they've heard tonight. Um, Raise your hand if you. Sure. Yeah. So you need to come forward then, and the, if you just move aside, so that he might speak there. And please um, identify you yourself for folks. Thank you for allowing us to address this way. Appreciate your, the comments very much. Um, it, it is. Um, please identify yourself. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Reese Davis, and I live on on Blue Hills Road. Thank you. Um, when we first um, came up, um, to the PWC meeting. Um, it, we very clearly came together as, as a package, Dana and Blue Hills together, because we, we realized the repercussions of one street getting it and the other street not getting it, whereas the, the um, repercussions were, were, were pretty bad. Um, so um, the reasoning <coughs> that you give is I, um, absolute engineering, and so it obviously is an issue. Um, what we would like to um, possibly um, be allowed to sort of um, suggest Hold on. again. Just one second, I'm sorry. Oh, we've got technical issues. Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's just going to be yeah, a little okay. bit louder. Um, Thank you. Um, <laughs> do you to start again? No, no, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, so the main concern is um, that if we are split, split in, uh, between the two, because we came very clearly <coughs> with the two together. Um, as you know, with drivers, uh, they'll very quickly find out that one street is slow, one street is fast. Um, the issue we have at the moment is Blue Hills is a, um, is a deceptively quiet street. Uh, there are no sidewalks. Um, people walk down the middle of the street quite happily. Kids play on the street. Um, they learn to ride their bikes and all that stuff. Um, where the scene changes rapidly is when you have the opportunistic driver who sees the back of on Route 9 I'm going to cut across, and you can see them down the end of the road, and they barrel down, straight down, 50, 40, 50, 60 not, miles an hour, not unusual. Um, um, as parents, I mean, over the years, we've resorted to shouting after cars, um, waving them slower. We even park cars um, strategically <coughs> down the street to try and slow them, and that works. But that shouldn't really be our job. We, we shouldn't have to do that. Um, so the, add to that the number of kids that are on our street. <coughs> um, we have 27 kids on our street. Mm. We have um, under 16, 23 of those are under 12, 13 of those are under eight. So the numbers, the cocktail is potentially pretty bad if 
um, drivers find out that, okay, Dana's no good, we're gonna go down Blue Hills. And we're very fearsome of what could happen. Um, <coughs> and I think um, with all respect to the issues that are obviously, this obviously is an issue, how do you do it? Um, we're just worried. And we, I don't think we'd have come together as Blue Hills and Dana together if, if we thought there would have been a one or the other issue. I don't think, I think it, we, we were quite clear. For, and then we've even had let John Willoughby, who's been leading the petition on Dana. I think he wrote a letter to you today, his continued support, you know, Dana wanting to see this as a package still, if it's at all possible. Um, I'm not quite sure how you'd want to do it. <laughs> But um, it is a, a major concern if, 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 we, if we get split up. Thank you. So, uh, so is this something that the Public Works folks, Public Works Committee, Public Works staff can continue to work with the neighbors on and decide whether this is the right time to do Dana or not? Um, I, like, I don't think the select board should just decide, like that would be fairly random and arbitrary of us. Um, but, uh, you know, can be, because those are very real concerns if you, if you do one versus the other, but maybe the, um, maybe the residents haven't thought about the fact that that could mean you know, it, it'd be a long time until you do Blue Hills or whatever. So there are, there are a lot of oh, different yeah. ways to think about it to, to kind of work out. So, um, so it, it, it's not too late in the process for you to kind of maybe put the brakes on that or, or however to continue the conversation. So everybody's nodding, so that's good. So, Mr. Musanti. Uh, yeah, we'll work with staff and, and with the neighbors. And, you know, um, the the issue with Blue Hills to me is a matter of when, not if, but like a lot of the road work and traffic calming work, uh, the when is dependent upon having the funds to uh, to attack that list in a, in a major way. Um, so um, I'm inclined not to proceed you know, to make a small, the dollars on Dana for the speed humps are relatively small, uh, but the whole point is to make the entire neighborhood, meaning both streets, safer. So if that, in an unintended way, uh, could in the short term create, you know, safety issues on an adjoining street, then I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded not to proceed on Dana yet. Uh, if we do get to be uh, funded uh, by the Commonwealth through the uh, transportation finance bill, uh, that will allow us to to uh, really attack this list in a major way, and we'd be in a position to complete the uh, water water line feasibility work, and then work in the uh, speed humps and paving, so that could be done in a coordinated way. So I'm very much persuaded by the uh, by what you're saying and by Mr. Willoughby's summary was provided to the board today. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brewer. So al along those lines then, um, would you then also speak with another aspect of staff to talk about enforcement on both Blue Hills, just in general, because obviously they're mm -hmm. experiencing this issue, but also as the Lincoln work starts up, because as the Lincoln work starts mm -hmm. up, then obviously it puts even more pressure on the nice smooth Dana, the not so um, sure. smooth Blue Hills, and so there will be consequences anyway, what, no matter what we do, because of doing the work on Lincoln. All right, um, Mr. Davies, anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, it's, it's in your hands, so it's fine. Right. <laughs> Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much for coming in and yeah. offering your comment. Other folks like to comment on the, the paving and construction plan, please come forward. And please identify yourself at the mic. Hello, I'm David Schmidt from, <coughs> excuse me, Blue Hills Road. Uh, thank you for recognizing me and, uh, and listening. I'd like to concur with uh, what Mr. Davies said. Uh, his concerns, I think, are very valid. I would like to see if I can persuade you to a slightly different conclusion based on some of the same facts. I think we all see the parallels <coughs> between Dana and how work on one impacts the other. But um, this is you look at the proposed construction list under C90 where the Dana Street work is listed at $7,300 approximately. And, and I'd like to put that number in perspective a minute and, and lead you uh, along with my thinking. That's um, 
relatively small cost, uh, about 1 30th of the tennis court item, a little bit further down. Um, also, just to give you an idea of um, the current state of things, um, my car was parked in broad daylight on Blue Hills Road and uh, broad daylight raining, but the midday, and a car smashed into it and did $9,000 of damage to my car. Thank God it wasn't a person because as Mr. Davies mentioned, there are no sidewalks, so our streets filled with people. And in the snow, snowy season, they don't even have the option of walking across the grass if they're children, right? The snowplow pushes up all the berms, so they're in the street for good. So $9,000 of damage, the cost of that one crash exceeds the cost of the speed humps, uh, assuming that it'd be the same as Dana Street. So since we can't really be sure whether it's one, two, three years out that we would get the, the sewer work done and the repaving, all those necessary preliminaries to the speed hump. I'd like to see if I can make the point that um, it's worth spending the extra $7,300 now, even though we're cognizant of the fact that the road would be torn up at some point in the future and, and probably to the tune of a few hundred thousand dollars of work put into it to redo the pipes and everything, that um, the current state of affairs warrants, uh, I think, more immediate action. Thank you very much. So uh, so the, the engineering folks will continue to, to work on the, the options there and how the finances work out. I'm, I would imagine, though certainly I don't know, I'm no expert on this, that it would cost more than the $7,300 to do it because you would need to actually prepare the road surface to make them adhere so you don't have speed bumps that are either just falling apart or being pushed down the street or something like that. But uh, uh, one of the things I've learned in this job is nothing is as easy as you think it is. So <laughs> that's why we'll, uh, we'll continue to have these folks um, work out the equations on that and consider the pros and cons. I think that all of your points have been um, well heard and are certainly very appreciated. And, uh, and we're just trying to find what the best solution is for the short term and the long term. So, uh, so please stay engaged with this and as, as they continue to work through those solutions. Thank you very much. Other folks like to comment on paving, please come forward. Please identify yourself. Good evening, I'm Jeff Kalman. I live at 42 Blue Hills Road. We're here in Mass tonight. I'll be brief. I hear that <coughs> the speed humps can't go in really until the road is vi viably um, paved and so forth. As a community, Blue Hills Road has um, informally decided that it, it's possible for us uh, to financially, if the town would allow it, to put in temporary speed bumps under the current conditions. So we would, because we have over 20 children who live on this one little stretch of road, um, we are willing to explore that option um, if, if you are likewise. Thank you very much. Sure. That's very uh, that's very solution oriented of you, and uh, much appreciated. So, um, so again, that will be part of the conversation. Staff and everybody will talk about the viability of that option as well. So, uh, that's tremendous. Thank you. Uh, other questions or comments? First from the public. Okay, Ms. Brewer. Um, completely understanding what you stated earlier, I want to reassure the public that we will continue to encourage staff to look at this. I mean, the select board won't say, you know, oh, we're going to do this one and not this one and pick and choose off the list. But when we say that, we don't just mean, yeah, thanks, but, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> we actually will talk about this because we have had conversations in the past, oh, you know, 10, 15 years, where we said we absolutely never, ever, ever want to put a crosswalk by the Jones Library. What a horrible idea. And whether or not it's a horrible idea, it's something we ended up doing, despite it seeming like we couldn't possibly do it. So, you know, this is, I appreciate that everybody's being really solution oriented and trying to take into account, you know, one affecting the other. Can there be some private investment here on a very temporary basis, understanding it's not a long term solution? So, we really appreciate people coming together with that, and people will keep talking to each other and talking to you and engaging with you. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, other questions or comments about any of this plan? 
All right, so next steps are that this, uh, some of this stuff still needs um, approval from town meeting. This is part of the FY14 budget, and whereas others is already funded, is that correct? Uh, yeah, the Pine Street water sewer needs uh, town meeting authorization. The other, the other items are previously authorized by the uh, million dollar bond issue or we're awaiting chapter 90 authorizations later this spring. Thank you very much. So it really just, it, it reinforces the necessity of the governor's transportation funding plan right. because uh, if we had more money, we could do much more road work. Um, okay, uh, anything else you'd like to let us know, Mr. Secchi? No, Mr. Braun? Good, okay, thank you very much. Thank you for coming in tonight. Thanks everyone for offering the public thank comment you. and uh, we, will, we will keep ourselves informed about how the Blue Hills and Dana situation um, proceeds. So thank you very much. All right, next up. North Amherst Local Historic District Study Committee status update has my name, but actually I think it's going to be Mr. Wald, I hope will speak to this. So we had some questions last time about um, uh, what was what was the status of this? This was something that residents had asked us to establish a while ago. I believe it was October um, that Select Board took a vote to, um, to establish um, a, a study committee for North Amherst, and then we had some questions as to what exactly is the situation there. So, uh, Mr. Wald. Okay, j just very in? briefly, uh, for purposes of background for the viewing audience, local historic districts are a special category under state law. They're found around the country, and they provide protection such that the, s the locale has the power to stop or otherwise modify harmful demolitions or changes to prop to historic properties. Uh, after It's a long process. It takes at least usually 12 to 18 months to create one of these things. Has a high bar like a zoning uh, ordinance requires a two-thirds approval of town meeting or a city council. Amherst uh, established the first one in the Dickinson Historic District downtown at town meeting last year. And there has been interest on the part of the public now in creating others, first of all from North Amherst. So the, the thing is, every time you do this, you have to start the process over again. The town has to appoint a, a study committee that determines uh, the merits of doing this, the boundaries, the rationale, documents, resources, and so forth, and then goes through a long process of consultation with the public, submission to the state, and bringing back eventually one hopes to town meeting or city council, as the case may be. Uh, the Dickinson district is really just getting underway right now. Uh, the first meeting of that committee, that is the committee that would administer the district and make any judgments, took place on Wednesday. Uh, town staff and the planning department didn't want to rush ahead with a new one until the first one was established. So that brings us to the next step. Under state law, uh, as the Mass Historical Commission explains, when an additional district is to be created, the existing historic district commission or commissions acting jointly, that is if there are already several, uh, is responsible for conducting the study drafting the preliminary report that goes to the state and the public and the public hearing. The existing historic district commission or commissions may, however, recommend that a separate study committee be appointed for the purpose. So that's where we are right now. Uh, so under the state law, in a sense, the, <coughs> I guess as you said, the existing committee has the right of first refusal. Uh, it could do it. It seems though, looking at what people actually say, that this may be a burden they don't want or need to take on right now. It's a fairly onerous thing. You've got a new committee just getting started. And so uh, there are lots of reasons for thinking that it might be sensible to turn that task over to a new committee for reasons of uh, efficiency and also because we want to bring in new people, including residents of North Amherst, so they have a voice in this thing too. So as far as I can tell where we are now, that's the way we're inclining. Uh, that said, you would face a different question down the road if you have multiple districts and then who administers the actual process and makes decisions. So I think if I can summarize what came out of the meeting, there's probably an incl inclination to create a separate study committee for North Amherst, but with an eye in the future to having a single committee that would actually make the judgments because then you wouldn't be training people. In other words, one committee can make the decision for multiple districts because then you've got the expertise in one place. You wouldn't be training people from scratch and starting over again. So that's pretty much where we are, I think, if that answers the question. Thank you very much. Ms. Brewer. <coughs> it very much does. Thank you, Mr. Wald. And um, because it was, it was very clear to the members of the select board that we weren't paying attention to that part of the law when we 
developed the charge for the <coughs> North Amherst District Study Committee. We were working under the assumption that it was going to be just like the previous process in terms of the study, in terms of going out, uh, the staff needing to solicit people from the architect board, from the real estate, and, and doing the, you know, the exact same process all over again, as opposed to how you've very carefully explained and seems pretty obvious in hindsight that the existing group would, would serve that function going forward. I thought it was made clear, you know, and so there was this disconnect because we didn't understand that at the time that we wrote the charge because we wouldn't have written the charge the way we had had we understood that. So this being new to us, um, so I appreciate that they just had the local, the, dis the Dickinson district, despite people thinking it's been around forever now, really just had their first mm -hmm. meeting last week and they haven't actually formally yet voted to give up that right of first refusal, I take it, but that would be when they would choose to do so, if I would hope they would choose to do so based on our previous understanding and based on what you just described in terms of their workload as well, um, then we would be able to solicit those parties like we did mm -hmm. the first time around. And when I say <coughs> that, that's staff doing that. Those various places nominate people, then we also have at large members, et cetera, and then that process would really get going. That does not mean that people can't be turning in their citizen activity forms right now, so that would be fabulous, but um, because there are at large members of the public to be involved as well. But at this point, it sounds like in terms of next steps for staff to do, it's now the p at the point for any of us to do for the Dickinson group to go ahead and meet again to choose to say, no, it's fine with us if this time you go ahead and do it this other way. And then in future, <coughs> there'll be two of us and then we can all, two of us bodies, assuming that that one actually happens as well. And then they could work together for future. Mr. Wong. Yeah, I think that again, I was unfortunately unable to attend the meeting because of my work schedule, but I, I, that's my sense of what came out of it after conferring with Mr. Malloy, our associate planner. And I should say too, I mean, I didn't think particularly about this other uh, or the default option when we crafted the charge, but that's in part because uh, the thinking of town staff all along was, was more logical to have two committees, but probably we should have made more explicit that uh, choice or that fork in the road there just to keep things uh, clear. Thank you. Um, so then our next step is essentially to wait for a, re a recommendation oh, request from um, the current committee to see if we need to establish and, the, and then uh, recruit for, as Ms. Brewer said, a new one. Okay. Anyone from the public want to comment on this? <coughs> Ms. Keller, please come forward and identify yourself at the mic. <coughs> Janet Keller, Precinct 1, North Amherst. And as you know, we're very excited about the district. Um, we've been in conversations with staff, um, with members of the Dickinson um, Local Historic District, um, and with uh, folks from North Amherst who might have expertise and interest in um, uh, serving. And there is quite a bit of interest, and um, uh, we will heed Ms. Brewer's um, injunction to uh, get going on those activity forms. Um, um, so uh, I guess that's our little update. Thank you very much. And very much appreciate uh, the assistance of, of Mr. Wald in working on this. Thank you. Thank <coughs> you. So Ms. Brewer, as far as the CAFs go, um, we don't have such a committee. How do you submit? Oh, it's, it's right there on the list. The North Amherst Oh, the really? Study committee is Excellent. on the list. We are soliciting people. Some people thought they'd turn them in, et cetera. And so, but it's there. And, you know, if by some strange quirk we wouldn't choose to do it this way, oh. then we'd have their information on file for future right. historic type appointments. So Terrific. please don't let it stop you that we have these other steps to go through. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions or comments on this topic? All right, moving right along. Uh, food truck regulation status update. Um, so at the last meeting, I gave you the details, kind of the overview, actually that was two meetings ago, and then we kind of checked in on it last meeting and said, you know, any comments? Where are you on this? Um, I had hoped to have either the regs for now or the first April meeting, depending how things worked out. I don't have them for you now. They would have been in the packet. Um, has not been a lot of progress on this, I gotta admit. Um, I will say that we did get good comment from staff. We, uh, we circulated them to staff. We've gotten good comment from Board of Health, <coughs> um, Public Works, and the Town Collector's Office. Uh, there are still some questions from Select Board that I need to get answered and get more um, clarity on how the parking part of it would work. But uh, 
and we have not in the meantime had any other public comment or business community comment um, so the goal is to have them for the April 8th meeting which is looking pretty good at this point so any questions or comments about that anyone from the public want to comment on the food truck regulation situation no all right moving right along so next up, we have rental regulations and permitting report, safe and healthy neighborhoods update. We have Mr. Zomak, chair of that fine committee here with us tonight. Uh, in the packets, we have an overview of the regulation situation, kind of like a translation, if you will, um, as well as a set of draft regulations. Those draft regulations are from the committee's last meeting, um, <coughs> so they do not reflect the revisions that were made at that meeting. A more recent version is now available on the website on, on the Safe and Healthy page, um, so folks can check that out if they're interested. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Mr. Zomak. Great, Welcome. thank you very much for having me. I'm joined here tonight um, by Janet Keller, a member of the working group, and thank you for being with us uh, as well, Janet. And um, I will try to be very brief because I think uh, you've received some very complete information in your packet. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about the efforts of the working group. Um, first, um, I'd like to publicly express my thanks and deep appreciation to the members of the working group. Uh, this group has been working extremely hard and diligently since November of 2012 um, to respond to the charge of the town manager uh, to develop um, uh, at the time what we were calling a set of rental regulations. We, we know now this is a, a really a, a should be called a bylaw. Um, and um, as Ms. O'Keefe um, indicated, you have in your packet um, uh, the version from last week. Um, we, the working group is meeting again tomorrow. Uh, and we have a slightly revised version that the group will be considering tomorrow. Um, I, again, referencing Ms. O'Keefe's uh, summary, I think it is uh, a very uh, thorough uh, and um, well put together um, uh, illustration of where we've come and where we are today. We've had um, excellent input from the public. We've had uh, numerous, numerous public meetings in this, in this room, in this forum, uh, from three to five in the afternoon, and we've held two public <coughs> forums that were extremely well attended. We've had dozens and dozens of comments uh, throughout the process, and uh, I'm excited to now bring it to you and to other boards and committees in the lead up to town meeting. This week, we'll be here before you tonight. Tomorrow night, we'll be at the ZBA administrative uh, meeting, and I'll be joined by other members of the working group on uh, Wednesday night, we will discuss it with the planning board, and again, uh, all of this in the lead up to town meeting. Um, I think the document and the process has come a long way since November 2012. We have a document that um, is responsive to Mr. Musanti's charge. Um, I will say that uh, part of that charge is was that we addressed the four unrelated, um, some of the lingering questions about four unrelated, and that bylaw and the group early on in the process decided to table that. Uh, they felt as though that was just too much uh, and we didn't have time to do that before Springtown meeting. So I think what you have before you is a, is a proposed bylaw, a draft bylaw that is, um, uh, that meets the, uh, the uh, expressed purposes uh, one through 12 that Ms. O'Keefe was so nice to outline and happy to take questions. If you wanted to add anything, Janet, feel free. Um, I'd like to echo uh, the comments about the work that the committee uh, did and the staff. Uh, it was a very large effort. Um, I think perhaps wise to tackle the bylaw and, and not take any side trips. We certainly felt like we had our hands full. Um, and I uh, would like to com commend the efforts of all involved. And it is my hope that um, in this final meeting that we will retain some of the features that certainly brought, um, as you may know, I'm uh, sitting on this board as a representative of the um, Coalition of Amherst Neighborhoods. And from the outset, we had and still continue to have a very, very strong uh, interest in the behavior aspects of this, and I know the landlords have felt that's 
a tough one for them, and I certainly can appreciate that and understand the state law um, that they're operating within and has a number of constraints. That said, I do think it's terribly important that we retain as many protections and recognize that landlords, um, and many of them are demonstrating this every day, have a great efficacy when they set out clear expectations and then <clears throat> when those expectations aren't met, act promptly to bring uh, behavioral issues that have spread throughout town um, to the great detriment of the town. Um, and um, it's our great hope that um, we'll remain strong through this, this final um, session that we're having tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to add, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Musanti? Uh, no, I also want to uh, ongoing thanks to the working group uh, <coughs> because the uh, set of recommendations that you've essentially endorsed last week and there'll be some really what I think are relatively minor edits, clarifications for tomorrow. Uh, the other focus of tomorrow's session uh, that I've asked staff to uh, explore with the work group is, okay, we have a draft set of recommendations uh, that have been endorsed. Uh, I, want, I would like to have some accompanying recommendations uh, about an implementation plan, uh, some sort of you know, overview of a schedule, and then recommendations on, on staffing and fees to, to uh, uh, implement this successfully. Um, so I know that'll be a focus focus of tomorrow's meeting, and uh, I'm I think we are on track. I think I'm on track to be able to offer recommendations uh, 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 with this input from the uh, working group in time for your consideration for the uh, annual town meeting warrant that you're scheduled to sign on April eighth. Thank you. Um, so, uh, because not everybody has read these documents, um, I'd like to give a little bit more of a, of a detailed kind of summary of, of where we are and what we tried to do. Um, so, going from the overview document that's in the packet, and I'm not going to read through this, but just um, because some folks are watching this for the first time to really get a sense of things. Um, we got together under the charge that uh, Mr. Musanti presented to us to try and figure out how do we deal with the um, the, the the growing spread of problem issues associated with rental properties in town. Those, uh, those issues are, um, they're behavior related, they are um, aesthetics related, they are related to lack of awareness by tenants and landlords about um, what the town bylaws are regarding any number of things. Uh, it, it's related to some tenants, in fact, being taken advantage of by uh, landlords, the tenants really not understanding what their rights are. So um, we wanted to really put together something that would benefit all stakeholders, and the stakeholders are the tenants, the, the owners and managers, uh, neighbors, the public at large, and certainly our code enforcement officials. We want to be able to establish baseline compliance with certain life safety and sanitary codes. We originally had uh, gone down the road of expecting to do that through periodic inspections. Uh, the inspection process proved to be too complicated, and there are really so many laws that are associated with these things, you just can't even believe it. So a lot of the things we originally thought we wanted to do turned out to be not, um, not practical. Um, <coughs> So baseline compliance will now be uh, be a, a self-certification. It will be uh, a criteria determined by staff about um, building and safety code, and, and uh, folks will now attest to that. Um, additionally, to establish baseline awareness of town bylaws and health regulations for property exteriors, so just like we've got interior safety issues to protect tenants, there are also exterior issues, uh, the ones that will probably come to bear again tonight, uh, involve things like um, clearing sidewalks after snow and ice. That's something that typically uh, renters often don't even know about. Um, and there are a number of things like that. Uh, to establish parking plans appropriate to each property, it has been clear to the working group since the beginning and, and it's clear to all of us in Amherst that um, parking issues have been a, a really significant um, problem. And so that was a key thing for us to address. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail how we did that. Uh, in a minute. 
um, to establish clarity on occupancy limits. We talked about uh, needing to address the foreign related persons, but choosing to essentially table that. Um, so what we've done is, is, is reaffirm, that is the law of the land. And so we want to have uh, absolute clarity, again, on behalf of the, uh, the landlords and the, the tenants that uh, for unrelated is, uh, is what will be enforced. Uh, we want to establish contact people to handle non-compliance. It's part of kind of the registration of all properties. Who owns these places? Who do you follow up with as a code enforcement official or as a neighbor if you have a concern? Um, to establish penalties for non-compliance, obviously. To establish baseline awareness of town bylaws about noise, alcohol, and nuisance behaviors. This has been a really critical part of this. and. Um, making sure, again, that people are clear about what the expectations are and what one could get in trouble for. Uh, we want to codify these regulations appropriately to make sure that they take effect immediately, and that was why we went the uh, course of a general bylaw. Uh, and to encourage providing timely access to properties for code enforcement officers to investigate complaints. That speaks to the access question I talked about earlier. Uh, you, can't just, you can't just mandate <laughs> access. Uh, it very much depends on um, the tenant uh, allowing access. So, um, so we want to encourage the fact that it's really to the, to the tenant's benefit uh, and to everyone's benefit if code enforcement officials can get in as soon as possible. Uh, to a property to investigate a complaint. Uh, and that we want to ultimately have a comprehensive list of rental properties. And that is something that we don't have now and, and clearly need. So those were, those were kind of the things that we started off as, um, as looking to address with the rental regulations. Um, so kind of what they've ended up being is uh, registration, self-certification about health and safety, as I mentioned, a parking plan. Uh, and those are the things one, uh, a property manager or landlord needs to fill out to get a permit. You've got to register, fill out all your information as, as would be specified. You've got to self-certify on the health and safety issues uh, as well as providing the, um, the information about town bylaws, et cetera. All that is detailed on the, uh, the, the second page of the overview document. Um, and a parking plan. You need to submit a parking plan for approval to the uh, building enforcement officer who will sign off on your existing parking situation, which would be only pavement. Um, there will not be parking on, on grass or dirt. Uh, or if you want to expand parking, then you would have to go via the zoning bylaw. So that, that's, what, that's what a rental permit equals right now. Those are the steps you need to take. You need to register, self-certify about health and safety, and get an approved parking plan. There are fines for violating uh, any elements of this, and these are primarily fines that are already associated with the zoning bylaw, because really we don't have any new laws here. Um, the parking thing is, is one new law, and the fact that, that the rental properties need to be registered, but by and large, we have not created new uh, bylaws. We have put together, uh, really compiled and clarified the bylaws uh, as they exist with just those couple of new elements, as I mentioned. Um, there will be a fine for failing to register. We have not come up with what that fine would be yet. That's part of tomorrow's meeting. Uh, there would also be some kind of fee for registering, and we haven't come up with that either. That will be part of tomorrow's meeting. Um, and the, uh, the key thing is there's the potential for permit suspension in uh, egregious circumstances, truly egregious, of not cooperating with the code enforcement officials um, and, uh, and, and not complying with the law. Compliance is really what, what is being sought here. So there is, um, there is the, the potential for suspension if someone is truly just not, not cooperating with the town and, and really creating a danger. Um, as to the question of behavior, we talked about, we talked around, and we didn't quite get clarity on the behavior question at last week's meeting, whether suspension of a permit could potentially be tied to tenant behavior. And we're getting a lot of advice from town council here. The goal is to have, the, uh, have what we put forth be as practical and defensible as possible. So originally we talked about it being about truly egregious acts by the landlord. Um, so, uh, and when we spoke about, uh, town council spoke about the fact that perhaps the language still allows for, hasn't closed the door on the potential to include behavior there. There was a lot of comment at the meeting um, uh, a c not in favor of attaching tenant behavior to it, um, but 
where there's ambiguity there, we will need to clear that up tomorrow. Um, and again, looking for it to be something that, that town council believes would be enforceable by us. Um, as I said, this is really kind of a combination and clarification of the existing regulations. Um, and it, I, I just speaking for myself, I think that the main thing it does is clarify. It <coughs> makes it makes everyone's expectations very clear on behalf of the town to the landlords what their responsibilities are to the tenants. It will make very clear to the tenants what their responsibilities are as well as what their protections are, um, and it will make clear to the neighbors. Um, one thing that uh, I should have mentioned is that all of this information would ultimately be available online. So you can look, if you're the neighbor of a rental property, you can say, oh, huh, I wonder where they're allowed to park. Look, this is what their approved parking plan is. That's funny, they're parking all over their lawn or whatever. So, so the public will know. You'll also know who is the owner of that property, who would you contact if you had an issue and if you wanted to um, deal with the owner directly as opposed to a, cordon, a code enforcement official, which of course you should always do anyway. Um, so so it, it would be, it, it's just about being absolutely transparent and accessible and clear with all of this information. And I think just putting all of the information in one place, establishing those clear expe expectations <coughs> is going to really kind of lift all properties. Um, common complaints that we have heard so far uh, is that there were not any tenants on the working group. That is true. We did, Mr. Musanti did try to uh, recruit tenants for this, uh, specifically from UMass students, and for a variety of reasons, that was not successful. Um, pers and that's unfortunate. Uh, and of course, the fact that this happened over, we were having our whole meeting while intercession happened in the meantime was not most conducive to student participation. Um, but there you go. At the same time, I believe that what we have come up with is not onerous on tenants at all. Um, it creates parking limitations, uh, and it has the uh, people, so that is certainly something that would impact the tenants. Um, the potential for registration fees being passed on to them, that has been uh, identified to us as a concern. We haven't even established what those fees are, and so if it's a modest fee, um, that doesn't personally strike me as very onerous, especially in return for the clarity of expectations and protections that they'll also be able to enjoy. Um, they are worried about what a suspended permit would mean to them as tenants. Um, the regulations specify that a suspension wouldn't go into effect until after the end of the lease or if the lease were, um, were what's the word, when you vacate a lease or whatever, but if, uh, if the landlord had to end the lease with the tenant for some reason, um, th that it would happen after that. Um, so I can understand f folks would feel like that might destabilize them. At the same time, we're talking about permit suspension for such egregious acts that I don't, I don't know why tenants would especially want to be living in a property where the place was unsafe and <laughs> the landlord was incredibly uncompliant and uncooperative, because this really is for their protection as well. So. Um, so I, I didn't consider that to be a big problem. Um, so so that's, that's been one complaint we've, ha we've heard about, no tenants on the working group. So I just wanted to talk about how, how the lack of tenants uh, imp uh, impacts the outcome. And, and so my point is I don't think it's, I don't think it's too bad. Um, another complaint is that this is too onerous for landlords. And really I think that that's an exaggeration. Uh, as I told you, this is filling out a couple of forms. The, the phrase that we've been using a lot in our meetings is that these permits should be easy to get and hard to lose. This is really about trying to get compliance. It's about trying to educate. It's about trying to kind of bring everybody to the same level, but it's not some big gotcha thing, nor is it some you know, crazy bureaucracy or whatever. Um, we, we haven't established what staff might be needed to deal with this. Um, it, it, the, the idea that this is too onerous or too bureaucratic, I think just doesn't really hold water because really we're looking at just a couple of very simple things that we're asking of landlords. Um, some f folks have said that they're concerned they could lose their livelihood as landlords if, you're, if your permit could be suspended um, per property, per, per unit. Um, if you had non-compliance issues, they're concerned about loss of livelihood. Um, again, I think that's a huge exaggeration. We're talking about really the most egregious, anybody who is putting forth a good faith effort to comply, to work with the building commissioner to try and get to the point of solving problems would not be any in any um, fear of, of having their permit suspended. Um, some folks have said that um, that it would put their ability to get 
of financing on properties in jeopardy. Um, and I think that that's really an exaggeration also. First of all, we have examples of such permitting systems in other parts of the country, and that hasn't proven to be a problem. Um, additionally, I think that by showing that the town has high standards for the properties um, and, and really kind of a, a, a controlled and, and reasonable um, set of expectations, that actually boosts this protection of the investment of the banks, I would think. So uh, I think that that would be an outweighing factor, but that's just speculation on my part. Um, and the other big concern that we hear from folks is that this is not going to solve every problem of behavior by students or by egregious acts by landlords, and that is absolutely true. It's true. <laughs> it's not going to solve every problem. Um, this is going to go a, a long way to bringing us further down the field than we are now. We're hoping that it will make significant improvement, as I said, just through the clarity of expectations, really kind of um, just being crystal clear with folks what, what it is that the town is looking for um, and what the law is that we're expecting everybody to comply with. Um, as I said, we're trying, to, we're trying to make this go just as far as we can in a robust and legally practical and defensible manner. Um, there are, you know, if you could wave your magic wand and create regulations, you'd create different regulations, but that's not the world we live in. We live in a, in a world of, of practicalities and laws, and, uh, and so that's what we have had to uh, work with. Um, it's really about um, trying to get everybody on the same page, and I think that it really is going to do that. Uh, and that has been, as uh, Ms. Keller and Mr. Zomek said, just tremendous, tremendous sharing of information and perspectives, um, concerns, ideas through a, a diverse group. Um, so I think that, that that's a pretty good summary for folks who haven't read any of the documents of where we are now. And if anyone has questions for these folks or myself, please. Ms. Burr. So are you going to record that for town meeting members? Because <laughs> yes. it really is incredibly helpful. I mean, in addition to the document you already gave us, which was kind of a shorthand version of that, um, to know how we got there from here and, some, and those very clear concerns that people brought to the process, I think are incredibly important because people will read this and they'll, they'll ask those questions in their heads and knowing that, yep, you did talk about that. Yep, you talked about this other thing too. I think would be incredibly valuable. So think about how you want to do your podcast. On <laughs> My podcast, right. So uh, <laughs> there's going to be, there's going to need to be a lot of information to town meeting for sure. And so folks are working on that. Mr. Zomek, you want to comment on that? Yeah, just a quick comment. So absolutely, we did just record that. So uh, it's wonderful. <laughs> Use um, that. Yeah. Uh, a couple of other things that the um, staff are working on for the working group. Uh, w one has been requested, just a, a simple FAQ. So how does this work? What does it do? What does it not do? And, and um, we may well go over this draft. I have a draft in front of me uh, tomorrow. Um, one of our members, uh, Phil Jackson, Mr. Jackson, uh, very much likes uh, uh, different charts and graphs, and, and he's put together a couple of uh, flow charts uh, for us, so those are all available. And all of this information, we, we neglected to say, for those watching at home, interested in this in the lead up to town meeting is on the town website under the living section under safe and healthy neighborhoods. All of the documents we've used, all of the comments we've gotten, um, all of the draft uh, um, um, documents we've been working with and from are all there in chronological order so the group can see where we came from back in November of 12 to where we are as of tomorrow. And um, I think it's a, a, a great, if you've got even 20 minutes to just jump around a little bit on that site. You can see, the, as, as uh, Ms. O'Keefe uh, represented, a very robust process went into this. And um, I think uh, our document, which is now, what, about seven, eight pages long, um, came from a place of somewhere in the order of 25 plus. So we've, we've condensed, we've refined, we've edited, uh, we've taken out a lot of things that just were not important to this and gotten to it gotten a document mm -hmm. that covers all the bases without, as you stated, overreaching or creating a, uh, a bureaucracy <coughs> that uh, none of us are looking for, so. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Anyone before Ms. Burr? Ms. Before Burr. Alyssa gets her 14 <laughs> questions in, that'd be great. Um, I wanted to be clear, and because uh, I think it's true in looking at the enforcement procedures section here, um, as you stated, you want the permit to be easy to get, you fill out the forms, you go through the routine, it should be very straightforward, um, hard to lose, and so people could be, f um, landlords could be fined for doing 
all the kinds of problems they already have, not picking up the garbage and you know, not dealing with you know, a water heater that's broken or whatever, they could still be fined for all those things and pay their fines and go about their business and do that and not lose their permit because oh. they're still a landlord. They just have some issues they need to work through. And so I think that's important for people to recognize too as they're, going, as, as they're reading this, to remind themselves that all those things, even though you say it over and over again, like the, you know, referencing all the different bylaws we already have, all those things can still happen. And so when you talk about revoking a permit, it isn't because they have a messy dumpster right now. You don't yank their permit for that. You make them pay a fine for that. And then, you know, maybe some huge laundry list becomes a real problem at some point. But in the meantime, people are constantly working with these folks is the idea, right? Exactly. And uh, <coughs> there is the list uh, of the what the enforcement procedure would be. And it, it very much starts with, you know, conversations with the right. building commissioner. I mean, they are looking for compliance. And, and as I said, kind of a good faith effort towards compliance. You need to, you need to respond to the code enforcement <laughs> officer. You need to um, be part of a plan to address how you're going to solve these problems. Um, you need to take steps to do so within certain time frames. You need to pay the fines that would accrue to you if you don't do that. And suspension is so far down the line. That's when that's uh, I called it in the in the meeting uh, the nuclear option. You know when you sometimes right. someone can just be so intractable, so impossible to deal with that they are just not. They are not looking for compliance. They are not looking mm -hmm. to cooperate. That a, at a certain point, you have to say, you know what? This is <coughs> this is not appropriate. We need we need something beyond fining. We're going to take away your ability. We're going to suspend your ability <coughs> to uh, to rent this this property following the uh, expiration of the lease. Um, and I should note, and I didn't no mention this before, that suspension uh, should it ever happen, and and we hope that just the threat of it, the clarity of expectations, and the threat of it serve enough uh, as a, a, a to encourage compliance and to deter anything um, terrible. Um, if a permit were suspended, it would be appealable to a rental appeals board, I think it's called, that would be appointed by the select board. Um, so, uh, so even that is not kind of a, you know, the end of the line. It, you, there is due process at every, at every step. And, and associated with that, um, I, because I, I perceive that at least the occasional problem has to do with landlords saying, well, I told the tenants they were going to have to do that. And tenants said, I ain't doing that. So it's still the landlord's problem. And they will work through with our code enforcement people, which we now luckily have people that are more available to work with people to do those things. Um, because the bottom line is they can't just both say they're not responsible. And, and this is another, and, and I think this structure helps with that. Even though that's currently true as well, I think putting this into a bigger structure will help reinforce that. And then the only other question I had that was of significance, because you probably already dealt with it in your more recent revision, under definitions, under dwelling unit, although I'm very familiar with the delightful pros of our zoning bylaw, I have to figure there's a cut and paste area error in dwelling unit because it says used or intended for use by one family, comma, as defined by the town zoning bylaw or household for living, blah 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 blah. There there's some it's either a household or it's a family, it's not both. Um, there's a little confusion in there that I'm sure you all know what it means, but it just needs to be fixed. <laughs> let it us, doesn't make any sense at all when <laughs> it's written right now. Yeah, let us take a look at that. Yeah. Um, between I'm sure now and you're tomorrow. just trying to pick up the zoning bylaw piece yeah. of it. I get that. But. If I could just pick up on something you mentioned earlier and, and just to expand on that a little bit. Um, the code official, and really we're talking about it could be a number of different code officials. Really, right. it could be the building commissioner. It could be our health director or her staff. It could be our fire chief or her or his uh, uh, designee. And so, yes, I mean, our our um, standard way of, of dealing with these situations now is and always has been to work with mm -hmm. the, the landlord or the property manager or the owner, uh, in many cases, the tenants, um, um, if they're willing. Uh, and to, to um, deal with the situation. So this, um, as was mentioned earlier, really brings it all together in um, a transparent, 
easy to understand process and place. And under section 12 and 13, I was just rereading it again for the under time or so, um, under enforcement. I think it's very well spelled out uh, under one through eight on page eight. Um, and then um, under uh, you know that, that entire process and, and Ms. O'Keefe referenced the, the, um, the possibility for an appeal and, and the hope that if this gets passed, there will be the establishment of an appeals body. Um, and then under 13, really under 13B, one and two, that clearly outlines those most egregious situations which we think and what has been reported to us from other communities that have similar bylaws. Uh, there was one uh, reference that they've had uh, actually much, much uh, stricter uh, uh, rental regulations uh, in their community for something on the order of 25 years and they've really only had one suspension in 25 years. So under section 13B, one and two, that really outlines those, those cases and those situations that um, might cause a permit to be uh, suspended. And of course, nowhere in the document do we, uh, the word revocation is not in the document anywhere. Um, so I think, I think it's very clear. And uh, again, we look for your input and guidance here in the lead up to town meeting. I'll just note one other thing um, on the, that same page Ms. Brewer was referencing with the definitions, which is page two of the document that's in our packet, which is the last week's version of the regs. Um, we did make a significant change last time taking out um, the exemption for owner-occupied rentals. So this will now cover all rentals, um, including those people who are renting rooms in their house, which are completely equal under the law. Um, it's not gonna cover hotels, motels, residential facilities, authorized and operated under state and federal law, blah, blah, blah. Those would be exempt. But, um, but there would not be an exemption for owner-occupied. That was a legacy of when we had been talking about the periodic inspections and so that seemed like too much of a burden to put on somebody who's actually living in the home also. Um, so to try and, uh, again, trying to address all the concerns that people were bringing to us at every stage. So we said, okay, you know, that's a, that, that would be a, a good place to, um, to yield. Once we took the periodic inspections out of it and it's just the self-certification, um, it was brought to our attention that really we didn't need to exempt that mm -hmm. anymore. And in fact, it's to the tenants in particular uh, and the landlord's benefits that we don't because these self-registration, self-certification forms um, make very clear what the expectations are. So again, you wouldn't want to have somebody losing out on the opportunity to have the clarity of expectation. So, Ms. Fine. I just um, for me, it's a little bit confusing. Um, on page five, section C and D, um, I understand that, uh, well, under uh, C, it says that the owner sh won't be in violation if a tenant refuses access, but then the very next section says that a tenant is supposed to allow access. So I don't, I'm having a little trouble reconciling those two sections. I don't know if other people will, but I understand. You're under I'm section. Page. Okay, I'm on page five, and five. it's uh, one annual owner self-inspection mm -hmm. um, and checklist, and it's sections uh, C and D, because C, exempts the owner if the tenant won't give access, but then the next section says the tenant is supposed to give access, except if it's limited by the Constitution. That's my reading of it anyway. Now maybe I'm missing something. I might be able to help. Dave. I, yeah, I'm looking at two different versions here, but so oh, I'll, I'll okay. turn it over to Ms. O'Keefe in a second, but so we spent a lot of time talking about whether we could require the tenant or the landlord uh, to require um, access and, and force the, the uh, tenant or, or landlord to, to permit us access. And so I think this was an effort to compromise in that direction to basically say, if there is a situation that we need to get into the building, would the tenant voluntarily allow us access? And this is what happens now. Um, and if the, if the tenant did not and the, um, uh, owner or landlord or property manager tried repeatedly and was unsuccessful, 
uh, and could show us that they did try, then that would essentially uh, not be held against them. Sure, but the tenant, according to Section D, is supposed to give access. Correct, so that's reading. lease language that, that we're looking to have, but at the same time, even though you can make them sign a lease that says, yes, so I will give access, you can't actually compel them. There's, and tenants have incredible rights in this state. So Under you state can't, law, yeah. Um, so that's where the Constitution comes in. Uh, right. Um, so, um, so again, as, as Mr. Zomek mentioned, it would be a question of whether or not that would be held against the landlord. And so it would not be if the tenant okay. will not allow access. But encouraging the lease language is another mm -hmm. way to sort of plant the seeds with and, and remind the tenant that really uh, granting access is, is a responsibility that you have, but it is not something that can be compelled under law. Other questions or comments? Okay. Ms. Poor. Uh, so this is a little, little thing, but at the bottom of our page three, um, registration and permitting, A, application process and requirements, there's a section in red about except as may otherwise be permitted by the code official, a rental permit application shall identify the total number of rental units on the property. Why would we not, I'm, I'm missing, like, where did that come from? Why would we not want to know how many rental units were on the property? Like, what were we trying to make easier by throwing that in there? I, mm. I get the streamlining part. You talk about streamlining in another section, you know, like you don't have to fill out a separate form for a bazillion different units, but I'm confused by what that means. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk so, that out. But we're going to have to talk to uh, uh, Rob Mora or um, Julie Fetterman on that one. Mm -hmm. It might also be a town council issue. So we're trying to yeah. we're yeah, trying to make it as, exactly. as um, streamlined as possible, but then um, town council will say things that you need mm -hmm. to make sure you specify to sort of indicate the, you know, whatever, again, with the, the legislative intent and the due process. So that may or may not be part of it, or it might just be some random sentence that ended up in there so things. this is not a perfect document oh like no, there we're I'm not complaining I'm just oh, no, I, I trying to understand that. how it fits in yeah like why would we not want to know that I mean, right that does seem like something we'd want to know unless there's some weird legal reason I, I think there's we were pretty purposeful where we put these in so I'm sure there is a, a town council answer to that but we'll we'll Find research it before is. Three o'clock tomorrow. Afternoon. It might have been part of when we were trying to clarify that, um, for example, if you own an apartment complex, you don't need to fill out a registration certification form for all 250 units in your complex. You can fill it out for um, for for one and say it covers 250 units. Um, or you would say we, we might be breaking it down to um, for the for the especially for the self inspection checklist to say okay I'm. I'm attesting to this being true for units one through 50, right. and I, I expect section. to be able to attest to units 51 through 75 next year or something like that. But so it's it's talking uh, about which ones it's specifying. Fact, it jogged my memory. I think that that's exactly right. We, um, a couple of versions ago, decided that um, presented to the working group, and and they accepted this concept of that there would be one permit per parcel, essentially, if 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 I own one unit or I own 12 on, and, and each are on one piece of property, I submit one application for that or the one with 12. And in some situations, um, say in my 12 unit development, I'm renovating units eight through 12 right now. So in that situation, that language allows me to submit an application to the, to the town for uh, one through seven and then basically say eight, nine, and 10, 11, 12 are not ready now or need renovation, or it gives the code official some flexibility there uh, because the, the uh, property manager owner may not be in a position to submit it. There may be renovations or whatever is happening in those units that they're not ready for. So there can be a staggered uh, application, if you will, for that. There are all kinds of ways that um, once we went to per, a per parcel concept, we didn't want the landlord to say, I can't fill this out because this, uh, this doesn't apply to all my parcels. This was, there are various ways you might want to or need to kind of exempt or sort of put aside some of the parcels as it not quite applying to for reasons like mm -hmm. Mr. Zomek mentioned or that I mentioned. Um, so it, it's, that's what it's for. Ms. I, I would just ask that you really strongly consider getting rid of that sentence because you talk about 
that, you know, apartments one through five in, in this other form. And by saying this here, it implies that there will be situations under which we will not know how many rental units are on a parcel. And there would be no reason for us not to know that. They might not be active rentals, but I mean, just in terms of our information gathering, this just looks like a way of someone pressuring a code official to say, I don't have to tell you how many are on there, which I know is not your intent. So I would I think there's just a way, yeah, to clarify that, that without right. removing it, because I think we need some we need some safety valve there to make sure, because as as you said, that's exactly the response we got when somebody said, "Oh, I have 48 units, or I have 400 units on one parcel as part of one complex, but I'm only able to because I'm changing over 100 of them." Um, we don't want that to be an impediment to that owner or that property manager to submit um, and say this is a this is an achievable process. We just still want to so know that there are 500 yeah. units there. Yes. So uh, if if I could encourage us not to edit the document because we'll exactly. lose our minds. Just you know, <laughs> yeah. footnote it or something. Is if, what but I'm if asking. you do find issues, then send them to Mr. Yeah. Zomek because um, because we want the edits. We just don't want to edit them here. <laughs> so um, so that would really be terrific because any any input that we get about how to make it clearer or whatever is very valuable. So um, so thank you. But um, we just don't need mm -hmm. to talk about it here. Ms. Stein. Without yeah. adding any without yeah. editing. The only thing I would say is you might be able to put an additional sentence in that clarifies the circumstance <coughs> where that might be the case, and then people would get it. We will look at that between now and 3 p.m. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds if good. If we ever let you leave, maybe we'll we'll be able to. And I'll also note that, um, so this is describing, and the, the, I didn't want it to have to do this, but alas, I lost that battle with town council. Um, I wanted, I was hoping it could be like um, the self, the self registration form and certification checklist and the parking plan and then the regulations just talk about what the penalties are for not going along with that. But town council actually said you need to describe <coughs> the registration and the self checklist also. But the self checklist and or registration, whichever form it is, says um, A, that uh, no incomplete forms will be accepted. Ah, so right. if, if you've left blank the number of units, well, <coughs> that's not okay. uh, that's not a complete yeah. form. And the form will say exactly what we want it to say. So you know you're you're filling out the mm. form. This is this is an imprecise way of describing right. what those forms are. Cool. Other questions or comments, Mr. Zolmek or Ms. Keller? Anything else you'd like mm. to tell us about? No. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in tonight. All right, 8.30, where are we? Town <coughs> manager's report, Mr. Musnanti. Okay, uh, I'm gonna spend a, a, uh, quite a bit of time reviewing uh, what, what's come to be known as pre-St. Patrick's Day uh, celebrations. Uh, uh, and I also wanna talk about uh, our spring season ahead, and uh, what we're what we're working on uh, to uh, keep the community safe uh, in the spring. Um, pre St. Patrick's Day, uh, it's not unique to Amherst, but it is a growing phenomenon in college communities where there's a uh, celebration uh, prior to St. Patrick's Day, primarily involving young people. Uh, and there's issues of uh, uh, alcohol abuse, et cetera. Um, and so we're several years into this phenomenon. Um, the town took several steps working cooperatively with uh, downtown bar owners, Amherst Police, uh, uh, and others uh, to uh, uh, put into place a uh, uh, procedure on, on the Saturday, March 9th, that w we think in the end, in the downtown area, uh, created uh, minimal issues. It was relatively calm. Uh, we had uh, 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 pre-ticketing of, of, of some of the bars to uh, uh, keep uh, uh, patrons uh, at the uh, occupancy limits and prevent the uh, 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 long lines outside w that lead to other issues, uh, uh, disorderly conduct outside or drinking in public, et cetera. Uh, 
so we think uh, those worked uh, based on reports from uh, police and, and fire uh, in, in talking with, with many. Um, having said that, uh, it, there is a growing phenomenon of, of pre-St. Patrick's Day celebrations at locations uh, across town, typically in, in uh, rentals. Uh, the largest uh, uh, issue occurred off campus at Townhouse Apartments in North Amherst. Uh, during the midday and into the afternoon on, on Saturday, March 9th, uh, we think there was a crowd in excess of 2,000 student-aged persons uh, who were outside basically having an outdoor party on the quadra quadrangle area. Uh, there was excessive alcohol, fights, bottle throwing, including some thrown at police officers. Uh, uh, decision was made late in the afternoon uh, with public safety leadership to disperse the crowd. We had upwards of 20 police officers uh, on scene. Uh, uh, many members of the Amherst Police Department, upwards of a dozen. Uh, we had a large number of Massachusetts State Police uh, community action team personnel responded and we did have some uh, uh, backup support from the UMass uh, Police Department. Uh, that was in the late afternoon. The crowd was dispersed. There were six uh, uh, men, all UMass students, who were arrested at the scene. Uh, of the six arrested, uh, two were identified as uh, throwing bottles at police officers. Uh, who were attempting to disperse them. Uh, all of the, all of those arrested uh, uh, have been reported to the UMass Dean of Students Office uh, for internal uh, disciplinary action through the UMass uh, Student Code of Conduct process. Uh, fire and ambulance. Uh, chief reports steady calls for service that day, particularly between the periods of noon to six. And then again, quite steadily from uh, roughly 9 o'clock at night all the way to 5 a.m. the following morning. Over the course of the weekend, there were 21 total arrests, uh, the majority of which were, were uh, alcohol-related. Uh, I think it just, uh, uh, the events of that day, while there's been a lot of progress made on many fronts, uh, uh, by the town, by the university, uh, by uh, the greater community. Uh, this was a, uh, a not so gentle reminder uh, that uh, 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 these situations place unacceptable demands on the town's public safety personnel. And our resources, uh, again, were stretched to the limit, and that's unacceptable. Uh, moving forward, uh, very aggressively on a number of fronts, uh, and I'll focus on police and fire primarily uh, uh, in next steps. Uh, first on the police side, uh, at my request and in response to uh, uh, the, all the uh, dialogue we had, particularly during the up to the fall town meeting about the nuisance house bylaw and potential revisions to it, uh, the chief has developed a schedule of response costs to be assessed uh, against those uh, who become subject to the nuisance house bylaw and then in very severe uh, circumstances in terms of the number of violations at a particular property, uh, having those costs assessed onto landlords uh, as well. So that will be a schedule that is in place uh, as we head into the spring season. I hope we don't have to invoke it, but we will have that uh, tool in place for us. Uh, we have worked out an arrangement for mutual p patrols with the UMass Police Department in and around the Fearing Street, Phillips Street, uh, Nutting Ave areas, uh, particularly on weekend nights, Fridays and Saturdays into the late evening, early morning hours, uh, anywhere from four to six officers. And they're Focus 
uh, in addition to having higher visibility as a deterrent for uh, uh, illegal behavior, will be to really enforce quality of life issues related to under, uh, underage alcohol possession uh, and really trying to prevent some of these large parties from getting uh, started and out of hand. Uh, so it's really a prevention tool. Um, um, that will also be supplemented with our, our latest receipt of a state grant from the State Department of Public Safety, a $10,000 grant for alcohol enforcement. We've received that grant uh, for the past several years. That will also be looking at uh, open container bylaw uh, compliance and things like that. Uh, I have uh, uh, asked uh, the University of Mass uh, for additional help, um, specifically uh, looking for uh, police assistance from the UMass uh, PD uh, related to uh, uh, patrolling in the North Amherst area. Uh, in and around Meadow Street townhouse area in particular. It's really to prevent, try to prevent some of these large uh, uh, gatherings, unruly gatherings from occurring uh, uh, and provide that assistance in that uh, uh, needy neighborhood as well. Um, we were also, we are also uh, going to be getting assistance from the state police for weekends uh, uh, at the end of April, latter half of April. And they'll, they'll be helping us out as they have in prior years. On the uh, fire and ambulance side, uh, I have uh, authorized the fire chief to uh, implement increased staffing, uh, really for the weekends between now and, and the uh, uh, university commencement weekend, which is May weekend of May 10th, uh, particularly on the weekend weekend evenings. Uh, we have also uh, uh, been working with the Mullen Center Management, and uh, they've been very cooperative in working with us on uh, increasing uh, detail uh, EMS crews for uh, events where it's believed that a need for such services might might be there, and so there's, for example, another uh, another event uh, happening, I believe, on April 13th, and we'll have a a, a larger number of uh, EMS personnel uh, hired by the Mullen Center to uh, 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 provide services at that event if needed, and really act as a triage, if you will, as needed. Um, um, next, I've uh, been working uh, for some time now, and I'm uh, insisting upon action for this spring. Uh, some additional assistance from the university related to uh, helping us staff our ambulance crews so that services can be provided to all of those in need uh, all over town, particularly uh, during these uh, uh, Warm, warm weather weekends in the fall and spring. Uh, specifically, I'm asked, I've asked for uh, two uh, detail uh, crew ambulances to be uh, 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 funded by the university uh, for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights in the uh, late evening, early morning hours, uh, beginning at the end of March uh, for weekends uh, through uh, commencement weekend. I've also asked uh, the university to uh, uh, expand uh, university health services hours uh, on a, uh, 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 really for some of these high, when the demand is highest, uh, I want them, urging them to use their own resources to help us meet the needs of, of uh, students and others in the community to provide services. So that's a, a discussion that's very much in progress and I'm pushing very hard, very hard for that. Uh, the university is also working collaboratively with our fire department and fire chief 
looking at the student EMS force and uh, ways we can have greater collaboration with uh, the Amherst Fire Department where there's an opportunity for students to help students and work, uh, work closely uh, uh, with Amherst Fire in, in the process. So I think there's some very promising work that has begun in that effort and we're expecting to hear more uh, in the week ahead. And I'm uh, going to do my best to uh, get all of these remaining things in place for this spring. Uh, and I'll be able to report back to you uh, ASAP with how that's going. Thank you very much. Those are the, the public safety uh, implications of all of this have been just so mm -hmm. starkly demonstrated uh, in recent weeks. So um, the that you have uh, got a, a, a good plan in place on the police side, especially <coughs> in that you've got strong requests made to the university for both policing and uh, ambulance support is very important. And I think that the community is really going to appreciate that. I was listening to my scanner uh, on the Saturday, March 9th, when I wasn't downtown seeing how great downtown was working, but unfortunately the wheels were falling off everywhere else. Um, it, it was absolutely alarming to listen to the scanner and to be hearing all of these calls for you know taking all of these drunk kids to the hospital and you know and there were just so many of them and then you hear you know uh, 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 somebody having a, a seizure an adult having a seizure or uh, an uh, elderly person with heart issues and I mean it, I'm sitting there like on the edge of my seat going how are they gonna get to them how are they gonna get to them oh they did I mean it was incredible and they had they had fire trucks responding because obviously all of our uh, fire folks are, are also EMTs so they would have a fire truck show up until the ambulance could get there I mean it, it was really extraordinary the work that they did um, but that shouldn't have to happen um, the, the meeting that I was at at Campus and Community Coalition last week, I was saying, you know, this wasn't, the, the, the weekend didn't go badly because we didn't have enough ambulances. The weekend went badly because there was this outrageous behavior happening that was taxing us beyond all, um, all reasonable limits. Uh, so uh, so y it, your plan sounds great. I hope that the university uh, embraces that and, and responds uh, appropriately. So thank you. Questions or comments from Mr. Musanti? Well, I just want to say I think it's really important that UMass steps up to the plate. I think the idea of them having their health service open mm -hmm. and providing additional ambulance crews, I think it's terrible that our own citizens have to wait for an ambulance because they're busy taking um, drunken students uh, to Cooley Dick. So I, I think the goal that you, the goals you have laid out for getting the university to take responsibility are really important and I'm glad to hear of them. Other questions, uh, Mr. Wall? No, Ms. Brewer's here. Uh, Ms. Brewer has spoken many <laughs> times. You Plenty times. Go ahead. I was just adjusting you the microphone. You point it out. <laughs> well, I seem to, to notice a, a change in the conversation here. I think these measures are great. As Ms. Stein said, they we're asking the university to do certain things that should simply be logical since it's their population to a large extent, though not exclusively that's been involved here. But I got the sense in some of the press reports that the university was blaming us for this thing. So, you know, we work very collaboratively with the university I always tell people. on trying to solve these problems, and, and that's the absolute truth. And you know, sometimes we're going to disagree on what the better um, course of action would be. Um, as so, the campus and community coalition meeting last week was was um, it was a very important meeting. Very important conversations were held. Um, we, um, the, the university, uh, so I mean it's just my opinion that um, there, is a, there is a culture problem that they face that they're not taking enough steps to address and, um, and they're taking many steps and I applaud all of those steps. There, there could not have be a bigger change in the university's attitude toward uh, towards discipline and follow through and making those things happen very quickly. Uh, it really, it's been a, a kind of a sea change there. Um, at the same time, there is this larger issue of uh, 
of people perceiving UMass to be Zoomass, like in the bad old days, and I really think that needs to be confronted head on, um, and we don't necessarily agree on that. Um, they, th they were feeling that the bar event was more of a cause of what happened at Townhouse, um, as Captain Pronovost pointed out at the meeting. You know, they <laughs> was just an excuse. There are all kinds of things that happen. You know, the the Puffer's Pond situation was not based on any kind of a bar event. Um, th that was a terrible situation last year. We have had other circumstances at Townhouse. You know, the Super Bowl. I mean, I I at a certain point, you just you can't always be um, looking to 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 blame the trigger. You have to be addressing what what is the behavior that is and what are the expectations for what is reasonable. What is you know is this a is this a rite of passage uh, for college students and and it absolutely can't be. And that message has to come really loud and clear in in word and deed from the university. And I think that. Uh, They've made a ton of progress with that, and they still have a lot of work to do, just like we have a lot of work to do with, with all of the different ways that we're addressing these issues. So um, those kinds of meetings are really important to say, okay, yes, we're, we're doing a bunch of things. We're, it, we're better off for them than if we hadn't been doing them, but wow, we've still got big issues, and, and we need to acknowledge them and, and talk about them and try and solve them together, and, uh, and that's absolutely what's happening. I will point out that the, that the article last week that um, Mr. Wald is referring to, I think specifically, um, that covers about the first third of that meeting. You know, the rest of the meeting, and we'll talk about that more, is, is all about the other things that, w that we're doing together, but to, to be able to kind of express joint frustration about how these things go, which is really just a sign of that frustration. I mean, we are all working so hard at this in so many different ways, but at the end of the day, we still have big challenges ahead of us, but, uh, but we are working well to trying to solve them together this time. I, I agree with that in that it's very hard to change the culture, um, and I think it's wonderful how hard the community uh, campus coalition works and I'm glad that there's good partnership feelings then. But the main thing is that the university has to protect us, our citizens, and they have to make a contribution to that so that we don't have to have you on the edge of your sleep seat because we have town citizens who are having heart attacks or seizures and our ambulances are tied up. They have to help us because it's their culture that's causing this for the town. Yep. Thank you. Ms. Brewer. Because I talk so much. <laughs> <laughs> I meant that in a good way. <laughs> uh -huh. So just kind of random again, partly showing to try and really make it clear to the public all the things that have been said tonight that we are, we are hearing you, you know, that we are hearing all the different things that the community is saying. Um, about how this sort of thing has been playing out over time and what happened in the 70s and what happened in the 80s and what's happening now and the culture changes and the Facebook and the Twitter and all the social media and how all this plays into everything. Um, I, I really appreciate the idea of talking on all the levels that you've talked about and in particular a couple of high points for me are talking to University Health Services again because you know frankly I hadn't thought about the fact that we can have a hundred ambulances come in here from all over the world, take everybody to Cooley. What's Cooley gonna do with them? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> Cooley's just a little hospital. <laughs> they really are not, I mean, as much as they're great, I mean, they're not really as, as a, <clears throat> a patient's uh, child pointed out to me the other day, you know, she's in there with her mother with her heart problem and there's kids running up and down the halls in their underwear. And you know, it just makes Cooley's life harder, which makes everybody's life harder. So if we can keep some of them, just like we triage at the Mullins Center, I think that that model makes so much sense. So that would be awesome. Um, I wanted to mention again um, how much I appreciate. I know it's been a struggle over you know just a little bit of time. I've been in town talking about how to really effectively utilize the partnership between UMass Police and Amherst Police. They're both great incredibly well-trained, certified police forces. I mean, they're the best of the best. And they're the same size, too. In fact, sometimes UMass is bigger than ours. So it's not that 
mm-hmm. there aren't people that could work together to work on this. And so I'm really, really glad to hear that we may be continuing to improve that partnership of how might we most effectively utilize that, because I know that's something that's been kind of a sticking point for a lot of uh, residents over the years. I do just have to say, when I saw the letter, the letter to the editor from a UMass administrator that you know to criticize the over 21 bar ticketed entry as being an issue, I thought was just flat out ludicrous. And I am ashamed that a UMass administrator did that because really we have way bigger problems than that in terms of saying if you have a four paragraph letter, you don't say, well, that over 21 bar thing is what promoted this. That's not what the problem is. It's true, there are lots of crazy symbols out there in the world. When the UMass article came out on the Gazette, I forgot to bring the front page with me, right underneath, it didn't say riot, right underneath, it said, look at these lovely older people having a shot of whiskey to celebrate their Irish heritage. And I showed that to people and like, well, they're responsible. Well, but what message are we sending? We're sending a message that this is an important part of the heritage. I mean, yes, people are bombarded with all kinds of messages. I hate the fact that every time I drive over the Cooley Bridge, there's a huge billboard for alcohol. Welcome to Hadley, have a beer. Like, (laughs) that's not the message Hadley wants to send either. But I'm not gonna blame that for the fact that students act like lunatics. So, and the vast majority don't. But the few that do, we can't just say, oh well, consider the message. That Red Bull truck's driving down the street. Well, you know, that's just the way it's gonna be. We, we are better than that. And I know the Campus Community Coalition's work is better than that. And so I really, really don't wanna see another letter like that because that's not respectful of the really hard work you guys have been doing associated with this. So thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that, those, those messages. I mean, that's the kind of thing we deal with at Campus and Community Coalition all the time. And as uh, was addressed at the recent chamber breakfast, kind of all of those environmental and cultural influences that go into this that we sort of, um, we, we excuse and we disregard. But you know what? They're all part of it. And it mm. all just comes to a head when the students are together, away from home for the first time, uh, you know, living on their own on campus. And that's where, that's where a lifetime of the environmental messages uh, come into play, but it's also where you need to be setting incredibly strict lines about expectations and consequences, and uh, and so that's that's the message that that really needs to be getting out there even more loudly, even more clearly, because uh, uh, yeah, that's critical, Mr. Hayden. So um, I, I, you know, this is all very interesting and very good, and I, I appreciate the report. I'm going to. Um, register a um, certain level of frustration. <clears throat> I believe that this collaboration is entirely exists and is fruitful and everything else. But as far as I can tell, um, 1,994 students have no repercussions at all for having participated at Townhouse. Uh, as far as I've heard, we had to demand that they, UMass, provide ambulances. They didn't volunteer that. They didn't say, huh, you know, we have a responsibility here. Let's step up and do it. Maybe they did, but that's not what I've heard. Um, I don't, doesn't even sound like any more than two of those 2,000 kids are actually gonna have any serious repercussions. I mean, that was the report. And and that's that's terribly frustrating on so many levels. It's, It's terribly frustrating that the university police backed up the town, the town police um, at Townhouse. I'm not exactly sure what that means. That they sit in their police cars and, and wave as, as as people are racing back and forth, going to the. Um, and I, I don't ask for an answer now. I just just want it to uh, to provide rhetoric for um, the frustration that I'm sure I'm not the only one uh, is feeling it. Um, I'm hopeful that the work with the, the coalition. Um, the work with um, the, the, the UMass administration um, would be more, they'd be more forthright about it. I mean, I've heard nothing from the dean's office. Thank you. So all of this feedback is very helpful for myself and Mr. Musanti to be bringing to these conversations. Um, and uh, 
uh, to the point about discipline, um, th th this was a very well videoed and well photographed event. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so the dean's office uh, and the UMPD are actually going through those pictures and videos and they're going to uh, seek to hold accountable everybody who was, um, who was guilty of something, you know, and peaceable. And yet they still blame the town for it. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, need, I think I need more than that if yeah. I'm going to stop being frustrated. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going <laughs> to defend any of that. Um, I will say that the university, I believe they misjudged this event. And so I was having a number of conversations with them leading up to the event about who they were going to send messages to, you know, who, which students were going to receive information about expectations for the weekend. And, uh, and I went on record saying I, I really opposed the fact that they decided not to send a mass email out to all their students. They, and, and I understand the logic. They were afraid that um, they would be advertising the weekend and giving it more attention than it would have otherwise deserved um, or would have otherwise had. And I think that was a miscalculation. And so maybe maybe if they had it to do over again, they would do it differently. But they did, as, as the letter indicated um, from the beginning and apparently still afterwards, uh, view it as sort of a 21 plus um, situation, which was not obviously what it was, you know, the and and the um, you know, the, the ambulance records and everything uh, confirm that it, by and large, it's the underage kids who have the, have the issues with drinking. Those are the ones who are the vast majority of the transports that cause the vast majority of the problems. Um, so, so I think that was a miscalculation, but uh, I can only hope that that would be different in the future. I'm feeling very, for a great deal of catharsis to vent my spleen, and, and so I'm gonna <laughs> allow myself just one other rhetorical question. Um, is there an institutional memory at all over there? This is not the first year. It's not the first time on this weekend, this very weekend, when a dumpster didn't get burned or a car got flipped over or a bus stop got torn up. I mean, come on, I, I. <laughs> Many challenges, thank you, Ms. Burr. On a slightly different note, but still part of the town manager's report. Way back at the <laughs> beginning, <laughs> hours ago, when you started your report, um, you talked about the schedule of response costs, which I'm really excited to hear that we have, but it's still actually ours, even though it's developed by the police chief, right? So we need to see that at some point so we can help yes. let the citizens oh, yeah. of town know, yes, this thing exists, yes, it's real money, yes, it matters. We just need that I will as do part that. of our tool kit. Yep. Thanks. I, All right. I, I would just add, uh, not to belabor, but uh, you know, <coughs> the town and the three colleges, including the university, we are very much, I think, genuinely invested in each other's success. We want all of the colleges in town and the university to uh, thrive because when they thrive, the town thrives and vice versa. Um, um, I believe that the uh, university chancellor is committed to working with the town. And uh, this is very much a work in progress. Um, but uh, he has expressed a commitment to pursue both short term and long term you know, tools to, to make progress uh, on all of these areas that we've touched upon tonight. And it is difficult work, but it's essential work. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a good time for constructive impatience to move some of this stuff forward ASAP. It really is a, it, it's an incredibly complicated problem. It's complicated on the town side and it's complicated on UMass, Amherst College, Hampshire College's side. If this were an easy thing to fix, it would have been fixed a long time ago. So no one is doing things that they think aren't going to work. <laughs> they're only finding that they're not working enough. And so we're always trying to find new ways to make it work. And uh, so um, really just so that folks know we're, we're trying a, a, a million different ways and uh, and we're getting varying results, but we still are working very closely together to try and find better solutions every time. Ms. Stein. I just want to add one thing to what Mr. Musanti said. I think it would have been far better if the chancellor would have said something that would have shown <coughs> that he really 
is working on this problem instead of someone who was not as high up in the echelons at UMass. Um, I think it would have been stronger leadership and a little more convincing than that two paragraph letter that was in the paper, which was an irritant and not, and not an acknowledgement of really how hard people have been working in this town. Thank you very much. Mr. Hayden. On one hand, I have to appreciate the, the honesty of the letter. I mean, I think now we know. And we <laughs> might not have otherwise. All right, anything else on the subject? Hey, when Aaron's getting cynical, we are in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rizzi. Here I turn to the town meeting preliminary list of articles. 49. <laughs> it was a bad, bad uh, scene. So just very briefly, uh, uh, you know, in the run-up to select board uh, reviewing and signing a town meeting warrant for the May 6th town meeting, uh, you're scheduled to sign a warrant at your April 8th meeting, which is your very next scheduled meeting. Um, so at this time of, of the cycle, we, we have a working list of uh, prospective articles that might be considered at the annual town meeting, and uh, many of them are, are standard articles uh, that occur every year, and I thought there's a, there's a preliminary list in your packet. I thought I could <coughs> highlight a few of those uh, really the first uh, uh, f uh, 15 are pretty much traditional recurring articles, uh, budgetary related mostly. Uh, uh, the uh, item number 16 is water and sewer debt authorization. That is for the Pine Street work and you'll have a specific language. Uh, for the water and sewer portion of that work that would be authorized, uh, uh, recommended to be authorized at the annual town meeting this May, and so work could proceed this calendar year on that portion of the work. Uh, at the very bottom of, of the first page uh, and onto the top of the second page, there's uh, we have standard articles every year that allow for the possibility of a motion to be considered uh, uh, related to the use of reserves, uh, whether it's free cash or, or our other reserve fund, which is a stabilization fund. There are two items listed under the stabilization fund item. It's really a typo. Uh, those should be under the free cash uh, yeah. article. Uh, and uh, A is social services funding. That would be to uh, uh, implement my, my recommendation that I made uh, as part of my annual budget that if the CD, CDBG funding uh, uh, was cut by as much as half, uh, we, would, we would identify up to $90,000 from reserves to basically level fund uh, the social service agency uh, uh, account uh, from the current year. And the second I, I want to mention uh, I listed here is town gown strategic planning. This gets back to what I was saying a moment ago about short-term and long-term planning and the need for the town and the university to redouble our collective efforts at uh, working, working together. And uh, uh, the chancellor uh, 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 brought forward an idea at a recent meeting uh, with me to work uh, together and jointly fund a strategic planning uh, exercise that would uh, engage an outside consultant to help help facilitate this effort. Um, so that would cover the uh, a number of things to give bring some clarity uh, on uh, uh, the public safety stressors, if you will, that we talked about, or. Uh, uh, housing and other other issues and that how can we work most effectively uh, town and gown uh, so I've expressed uh, to him my openness f of that and uh, the notion of working together and jointly funding uh, such an effort so you can expect to see a specific proposal uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks um, 
Also going down, working down the list that's in the packet, uh, number 31, rental regulations. That's the Safe and Healthy Neighborhood Work Group. My intention is to uh, uh, take those recommendations and then offer, offer uh, recommendations to the select board for possible inclusion on the warrant. Um, and then at the very bottom of the list are a series of petition articles, one zoning-related article and uh, nine citizen petitions for a variety of things. And I know during the month of April we'll be scheduling time with, with the select board to review each of those. Thank you. Um, I'll just note, which number is it? Uh, general number 39 uh, bylaw nuisance house select board I'm not sure if that's gonna happen or not. this is the one we've been talking about for a couple of weeks now that I was working with a, a citizen um, to try and do this the citizen did put forth their petition uh, which is number 43 um, I think that they actually left out a part that was important to the select board and I think they did it inadvertently and I'm not sure if we're able to fix that at this point or if it's kind of too late for that so um, I haven't been able to give that enough time to, to kind of work that through yet but um that that would only be sort of a catch-up to uh to deal with what the citizen petition i believe has has overlooked so um we'll see how that goes questions or comments about the the list as it is mr hayden i'm uh, sort of noticing that there are 49 and maybe only 48 articles in the end which uh, reminds me of why Amherst is such a great place to be. It really is very <laughs> diverse. The, uh, the number of issues that are, are addressed in this are, um, what I, the exercise that I, I was trying to do with it was to figure out where the consent calendar would be, which mm -hmm. ones of these could be lumped together in a consent, because that was something we, we mentioned as, as um, um, an idea for town meeting. And I really can't find that many. Maybe the easements, but um, so there, there are six or seven that we could lump together. But everything else, not even the, um, not even the um, budget issues, can really be clumped together. I do know uh, Mr. Pistrang, who's the only person running for the moderator position this year, uh, is thinking uh, a lot about the consent calendar. So um, that is something that hasn't been used for a number of years, but he is going to <coughs> look to pursue that. I'm not sure what he's decided, um, but he's he's definitely thinking about it. So but let's uh, encourage him on that. Yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> Ms. Brewer. Do we know yet, um, it's a two-part question, I guess. Do we know yet if town council who you know obviously does lots and lots of things for us has been able to at least give these enough of an overview that we know these are going forward it's too soon isn't it we don't know the yet. petition articles yeah. they all have to go forward right. they're, well, they're, they they're, go forward whether or not they've received the, the uh, minimum number of required right. citizen citizen uh, signatures um, they are at town council now and he's actively reviewing those we end up putting them on the warrant, but then we sometimes have to dismiss them because they're just not viable. Right. So that that's what his recommendation right. to us will as be. Right, as to form. We'll have that prior to the 8th of April. Yeah. Okay. But everything will have to just, I don't want any citizens to think that their stuff might not no. end up on the warrant. It will because it has to. Um, whether or not there's a recommendation that is, in fact, viable and, and can go forward, um, we'll know we're closer to town meeting. Yes, thank you. I didn't mean to mean that town council was the gatekeeper because I wouldn't want that to be true either. Um, and the rental housing info bylaw petition I actually haven't read, but I'm wondering if that reflects, I'm showing my ignorance, but I'm going to go ahead and wonder if that reflects back to the long time bylaw we have that says how we send out this book about landlord tenant regulation, because I know that came up associated with early work of safe and healthy neighborhoods. I'm assuming that when it, a bylaw that currently, my point to bringing this up is that our current bylaw says we pass out this book. We don't pass out this book. So, well, I don't know what this petition article says. We obviously are gonna have a new bylaw that's gonna have information that talks about, which is going to be incredibly useful for people. I guess I would just like um, town council at some point to mention as an aside to us, when it's a simple thing like that, like you, we're gonna pass out a book and then we don't do it. I mean, it would be nice to clean up our bylaws and get rid of that, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, like, like how to describe to people like, yes, we don't do that anymore. Yes, we haven't gotten around to asking town meeting to take it off the books, but that doesn't mean like somebody's in trouble or something. It's just an old thing that hangs there. 
And I don't know, I mean, it's just one of those things nobody ever gets around to fixing because we got way too many other things to do. That's, that's pretty much it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we'll try and, try but and find it, it an answer to that. It doesn't you know, okay. that kind of thing. All right, anything else on the Tell me more in an article. So I did send an email to the select board for scheduling purposes that we had talked about that April 16th meeting being just if if we had to meet um, at that point, we didn't know what the warrant was gonna look like. Now that we have yeah. practically <laughs> 50 articles, like it's necessary, <laughs> there's no way to fit. I mean, this is gonna be essentially, you know, 12 articles per night, roughly. Obviously, it's not exactly how it will work out, but um, but um, regrettably, we need to meet all those meets in meetings in April. So. <laughs> All right, Mr. Musanti. Uh, yes, uh, I want to uh, make a couple of staff recognitions. Uh, first, uh, Vera West Davis, who has worked for the town for uh, the past 30 years, including the last 23 years in the fire department as uh, administrative assistant uh, in, in the fire chief's office. She's retiring uh, March 29th. Um, and I just want to thank her for her many, many years of dedicated service. Uh, Chief Nelson has described her as a, uh, a quote, constant who's provided uh, support to three different fire chiefs and describes her as uh, dedicated to the work of Amherst firefighters and the department. And so I want to wish Vera well uh, in her retirement. Um, secondly, uh, wanted to tell you in a, in a public setting, uh, I am, uh, uh, have uh, decided to transfer Debbie Gordon, one of the administrative assistants in my office, uh, to the fire department to fill uh, the position that was held by uh, uh, Vera West Davis. Uh, Debbie Gordon uh, provides a lot of uh, uh, administrative skill, people skills, uh, and will be a real asset, a uh, real critical uh, part of the fire department team, and I think it's a great opportunity for her. She's excited about it, and uh, um, Debbie w has been very, very helpful to all of us, uh, and particularly so to me during uh, a long time ago now when I was newly appointed uh, as town manager, we're going through a number of transitions, and uh, uh, Debbie, Debbie has done great work, and I think she has a long career ahead of her with the town, and wish her well uh, uh, in the fire department. Uh, the third one, uh, Susan Waite, our, our DPW's uh, solid waste and uh, recycling coordinator, recently received an award uh, in celebration of Women Award uh, from the Amherst League of Women Voters. Uh, it's an award given annually uh, to mark International Women's Day. And it's really related to community service, and Susan was recognized for her excellent work on uh, things like developing and doing the educational outreach and researching and coming up with a proposal that uh, passed either unanimously or almost unanimously at the Amherst Town Meeting on the polystyrene ban, a real forward-thinking uh, environmental initiative and she's done a, is continuing to do excellent work on uh, uh, refuse management uh, committee as we look at uh, reducing our waste stream short-term long-term and so it's great to see her recognized uh, by the League of Women Voters. I just pause to note uh, that Debbie Gordon has been such a terrific resource to the select board. She has, as you noted, been the, been the, the constant uh, through the big transition in the town manager's office. Um, she's such a huge help with <coughs> licensing, with stuff that has to do with committee work. Um, she is just, she's a lovely person. She's a helpful person and uh, we'll miss her, but we're very excited for her <coughs> new opportunity. Ms. It's going to leave a hole. It will. It will. It hopefully fills. Oh, I just oh, yeah. wanted to add that. Uh, oh, yeah, we're going to fill that. Position. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a purpose. Yes, uh, we are. We've begun the recruitment process, and uh, you know, we're we're we going to try to start. attract uh, top tier candidates, and uh, I intend to fill ASAP. Ms. Brooke. 
um, again, reiterating everything you said about Debbie's importance, not only daily, but also during the transition. Their last town manager has been critical. And I'm thrilled that she's still staying with the town. You know, if, like, right. if we have to lose her, at least we're losing her to another part of town. So that's excellent. Um, one of the things that's always fascinating, just fascinating to everybody <laughs> in the world, I want you to know about select board work is separating the process from the people. And one of the things that is really important to me based on previous town managers, perhaps versus current town manager, is I think it would be valuable for the select board, which does depend a lot on staff in the select board <coughs> slash town manager office, to see the job descriptions for Deborah Roussel as your assistant and for Debbie, because there's been a number of transitions in the way those positions were laid out <coughs> through the last transition from the town manager. And I think it's just important for the public to understand, you know, what these people do and for us to understand. And we all work together marvelously, and I don't think we tax people unnecessarily, et cetera. But because they're under the select board budget to a point, I think it's it's appropriate for us to know what those job descriptions look like, more so than necessarily for 99% of the rest of our wonderful town employees. No, I'm happy to happy to share those uh, with you, and you can imagine that it's a pretty uh, encompassing yeah <laughs> all kinds of stuff from you know the day-to-day -day kind of real administrative work to a lot of the uh, constituent services and things like that that people regularly come to my office and are seeking uh, uh, action from the select board etc so thank you mr hayden i just want to um, add my appreciation of vera's service she was the second person that i met when I um, uh, came to join uh, the service of the, the town, uh, Chief Hoyle was the first, but uh, that was before I was recruited to join the, the call force way back when, so I yes. appreciated her work. 30 years with the town, that's yeah. pretty impressive. <laughs> that's wonderful, we wish her well also. Thank you and congratulations to Susan White. Okay. All right. Uh, next, uh, there is a, uh, a letter uh, that's on your a draft letter on your desk and there's one in the signature folder. Uh, this is related to uh, notice of intent received by the town from uh, W.D. Coles uh, giving the town right of first refusal uh, uh, on a uh, uh, three parcels of land off of Henry uh, Street and, and Flat Hills Road uh, it, that's considered chapter 61 uh, land under that state statute, uh, the town uh, needs to be offered a right of first refusal, refusal uh, uh, within 120 days of receipt. So there are some issues, uh, technical issues, with the uh, uh, completeness of the notice that ha has been received, and uh, in consultation with town council, uh, drafted a letter the board signature since the request is to the select board to go to the uh, property owner uh, and identifying uh, issues with the notice and they, be, they, they would give the opportunity for follow-up uh, uh, so that the 120 day uh, clock is not yet triggered uh, until that notice is considered complete uh, and that letter would, would make, make them aware and there'd be follow-up with uh, town staff and with town council and the, and the property owner. Thank you. So this uh, this item wasn't on the agenda. Um, as of last week, the uh, late last week, the thought was that this letter might be able to come from the town manager and didn't involve the select board at all. But uh, as Mr. Musanti mentioned, town council said that because the notice came to the select board, right. the select board is supposed to respond with the letter. So, uh, so town council has created the letter for us and we just need to sign it. Uh, other questions or comments on that or anything else for Mr. Musanti? Do you have other things? That Just really quick, especially in the interest of time, uh, I want to mention five very quickly. <coughs> uh, recent or upcoming things. Uh, March 11th, I was uh, had a great time with uh, a number of you uh, uh, serving as a uh, celebrity waiter at the Empty Bowls event over at the pub uh, in support of the Amherst Survival Center. 
Uh, it was a very successful fundraiser, I'm told, for the Amherst Survival Center, and we had a lot of fun seeing a couple hundred townspeople come out and support. Uh, it was a good time. Uh, last week, I also had lunch, uh, lunch meeting with uh, Loomis uh, uh, Community CEO David Scruggs and App Applewood's uh, uh, administrator Rob Claflin, just getting updated on all things Applewood. And so that was very helpful. Uh, as a uh, uh, proud parent, I attended the uh, Amherst High School musical this past weekend, Oklahoma, and there were big audiences at both the matinee on Saturday and the evening show as I uh, went with various family and friends uh, to the performances. And uh, there's over 100, there's about 150 high school students who uh, participated in all aspects of putting on that. Uh, production and it just underscored for me uh, what uh, a priority that the Amherst uh, uh, schools and the uh, high school uh, place on arts and uh, uh, performing arts and uh, John Bechthold and other staff over there just really a, a very positive and uh, successful program uh, just wanted to highlight that uh, this Thursday, I'll be at an I, uh, ICMA, International City Management Association. They call this the Northeast Regional Summit. Uh, I won't be coming back with any peace treaties or anything like that, but it's a great <laughs> professional development opportunity and another chance to see colleagues from all over uh, New England uh, uh, on Thursday. So I'll have a report next time. And then also a plug, uh, this coming Sunday, March 24th at 2 o'clock, uh, the Friends of the Amherst Senior Center are putting on their fourth annual Amherst Follies show uh, at Buckley Recital Hall at, at Amherst College, and it's a big fundraiser for the uh, Friends of the Senior Center, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Questions or comments for Mr. Misanti? All right, moving along then to member reports, JCPC update. Jim's turn. Break routine, and I'll do it this time. Uh, ag again, in the interest of time, since I'm trying to summarize at least four hours of two meetings, I won't go through everything. But uh, basically, we're done now hearing presentations from the different uh, budget units, and we'll begin deliberations on priorities and actual numbers uh, starting this coming week. Uh, on March 7th, we heard from the Department of Public Works, information technology, and the information technology component of the schools. Uh, basically, DPWs ask about $906,000, which I'm not mistaken is about, is down from one and a half last year. Uh, $500,000 just for road repair coming out of Chapter 90, in other words, state money that we get. So technically, it's not part of the capital budget in the sense that it's a different, it's a different funding <coughs> source, but it's traditionally listed there. So that's part of the, the reckoning here. And among the $406,000 rem remaining, a large part of that has to do with heavy equipment that's really in dire need of replacement. Uh, snow plows, trucks, road crews, things like that. So that's taking up a lot of it. Smaller pieces, money for the DPW building, uh, sidewalk money, light relamping, and things like that. So, but those are the big ticket items. And there may be some flexibility, as I understand it, with Chapter 90, depending how these things work. So sometimes they're broken down in, in ways that allow us some kind of leeway, uh, depending how things break down. If, figuratively speaking, I mean the budget, not the, not the <laughs> trucks. The trucks are broken already, a lot of them. Uh, Possibilities also from tree, tree removal work there for safety issues, uh, equipment that has to keep, keep limbs that might fall on buildings and power lines, things like that. So that's the, the pretty much the picture there. Uh, town IT coming off a very successful year, Mr. Pakunas says. In fact, our most successful. Uh, the town has been pretty good about funding requests. And basically what IT has been trying to do is to streamline and make things more efficient in the sense of, uh, for example, consolidating to fewer large units of equipment uh, while remaining uh, of, uh, maintaining the same service level. So for example, getting rid of lots of little personal copiers and printers and things like that and putting in big ones. That means they cost more and each one is more crucial, but it works out better for the whole. Uh, another big project there, the total we're talking about here is $346,000. You know, 123,000 for inf infrastructure replacements, computer units, uh, big tasks, $70,000 to digitize documents. They're now stored in the basement of town hall. Some of those we need to do for preservation, some for regular access, but that also frees up space. So, for example, if we get those documents digitized, 
we can take the voting machines out of this wonderful space here and put them down there, and the documents will then be stored in North Amherst School Basement where the Survival Center used to be. So there's a lot of a, trying to make more efficient use of space and things like that, too. Uh, other expenses include some Wi-Fi upgrades, uh, the Munis modules, the software that runs the town, uh, it helps us keep track of inventory, fleet, and job applications. Interesting thing, repeated from last year, which was uh, not granted at the time, is $33,000 for a hybrid vehicle. I think people don't realize that we have a huge, a large fleet of vehicle, over 100, 120 something, or 123, I forget. Uh, there's no dedicated vehicle for IT, and yet we have multiple buildings that have to be serviced, the town hall, the schools, the library, and so forth. People have to use their private vehicles for that. So we're asking for a hybrid, or I should say IT is asking for a hybrid, JCPC hasn't determined, and it might be funded under green communities, so there's a good chance to save some money there, or to get some money even, as part of our, our green fleet incentives. Uh, again, copiers, plotter, scanner for the big maps we produce for planning, things like that, no surprises. Uh, schools have a lot of money in uh, $26,000 for copy replacements, again, one for each business unit, trying to centralize there. Uh, about $190,000 for com computing equipment. Schools are moving more towards smaller and portable devices, in part because the way we use computers is changing, but also, for example, we're getting rid of the paper MCAS, but we don't have a single lab where we can put 80 or 100 computers and the students have to take a test in the same proctored space. So laptops and iPads, tablets, things like that make that more, more flexible also. Uh, school facilities, we've got $671,000. Different kinds of priorities, so for example, there's only $5,000 for a special ed van, but that's the highest priority in a practical sense because as Mr. Uh, Hanawitz says, if the kids have to get to school. On the other hand, a different high priority, actually marked very high, which is unusual, is $150,000 for security, uh, partly in light of Newtown and things like that. Uh, they're very, and you heard about this also with regard to the, the wild, with, you know, the places with open floor plans. Uh, very technical things, how doors can be locked or not locked, what kind of access can be shut off to a floor or a section and so forth. So that's vital. I know Mr. Mazzanti worked on that this past fall. Uh, you heard about generators and so forth for the schools, uh, miscellaneous things like that. Uh, not, sorry, you heard about boiler replacement. Generators also, which are partly a safety issue, they were there for backup and for emergency use. So those are essential kind of things. Uh, town facilities, about $190,000. Miscellaneous things, town hall, bang center, uh, North Amherst, lib uh, North Amherst former school to rehab the basement to make it a document storage area, safety of the Munson Library steps, things like that. Uh, so that's pretty much where we are. You know, they all they all sound important, but each group is asked to prioritize, and we're going to sort through and try to make what two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars in adjustments between now and the time we get to a town meeting. Okay, thank you, Ms. Stein. Did you want to add anything? <coughs> And the only thing I think I didn't hear Jim say, and he talks fast, so I don't always catch I'm it, looking was at the clock, that sorry, yeah. uh, no, it was good. Um, there was a possibility that the car for IT might be electric. That this was an interesting option that Mr. Poole right, had yeah. suggested we explore, and so I thought that was different. Right, something high high energy efficiency that would fit the right. green community, but side. still right. green communities yeah. eligible. Right, thank you. Questions or comments on the JCPC report, Ms. Brewer? I actually want to drag the town manager back into this and see if he wanted to give a two-sentence synopsis of the really great explanation he <coughs> gave to a member who, who was formerly a select board member who was here earlier, but a DAAC member now who was asking us about, you know, when we do things at the capital, at the capital planning table, do we think about all the other things we're trying to <coughs> do in town as well? And I know that's come up before associated with historic preservation, for example. Are we effectively comparing what might be funded under CPAC, mm -hmm. what might be funded under JCPC? And he was bringing in, you know, are we really, are we looking at our transition plan associated with disability access? And the town manager had a really good answer for that. So I'm putting him on the spot now just to say briefly, that the answer is yes. We are trying to make <laughs> sure we are staying aware of all of these things while we're doing this. It isn't that people are just looking in a very narrow, or you know, we're just talking about copiers and pieces of equipment. We're looking at bigger mm -hmm. issues as well. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes, but it can be better and made more clear to all of the staff. And so one of the uh, suggestions I've made to uh, Finance Director Sandy Pooler as we, you know, continuously try to tweak uh, 
how we review projects is to look at that project request worksheet right. that we developed a number of years ago that for every single project there's a list of criteria and there's a section on there that talks about what are the objectives that are achieved in uh, individual requests could be anything from you know safety or energy efficiency or you know various things but having one that's explicit right on that right. checkbox about you know furtherance of the uh, disabilities access uh, uh, plan and having so that can be more easily flagged at the staff level my level and at the jcpc level excellent thank you other questions or comments on jcpc and other liaison reports <coughs> this time well the Slurp Board Office got a call today from Senator Stan Rosenberg um, and the state. Um, they are interested in our flag and they wanted to know when it would be ready because they are actually trying to finish up having one flag from every town or municipality, I should say, in the state. And um, obviously we are one of the last half dozen or maybe we are now the last. However, I am happy to report that I should be able to pick up the flags on March 29th mm -hmm. and therefore we should plan to have a formal presentation from the Rotary at the April 8th meeting so that they can present the flag that they have purchased for the State House to the town and then uh, we can make arrangements for having it hung at the State House. So I thought that was pretty exciting since we now actually have a pickup date. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, other than that, this is the week that the Japanese middle school students and the Japanese contingent come um, to visit and they will be here starting, I think it's Thursday. Um, so that's Kanagasaki's sister city committee has been working hard on planning the agenda for when they are here. Um, I did not get to, um, well, I got to the um, mm -hmm. community uh, reading together event, which was the uh, secret life, the brief, hmm, wondrous life of Oscar Wow. Um, and Juno Diaz, the Pulitzer Prize winning author spoke on March 11th and the auditorium, the um, Amherst Regional uh, middle school auditorium was full and people were extremely interested and he was, well, he used very colorful language, but he was very, I think, impressed with the nature of the questions that our Amherst audience provided for him. <clears throat> it was very delightful. And then the Community Preservation Act Committee met on March 14th and did the best they could with the limited amount of money that they had for all the projects. Um, I think what they came up with is, is pretty good. Uh, the Historical uh, Society is getting the 21,000 uh, plus that they asked for for preserving um, the artifacts well, including Emily Dickinson's dress. Um, Amherst Media is getting uh, 54,000 almost for preserving the historical uh, records, recordings that, um, that they have of the town. Um, the Tiffany window uh, will be restored and put back in the Unitarian Church for the enjoyment of the town for $106,000. This is of course assuming that town meeting approves the, the Community Preservation Act Committee's recommendations. 14,000 will go for the Jones Library roof repair. Um, the Brunel Phase One property um, will cost 156,000. Um, okay, then there's, I'm missing, I have an abbreviation and unfortunately I don't. I'm gonna have to think for a minute what that's for, but 125,000 will be the Community Preservation Act um, Committee 
uh, support for purchasing the Rock Farm, which is the five acres in South Amherst that almost got to be the site of 17 condos, and instead five acres will be preserved. Um, they had to work very hard to be able to come up with a ba basically half a million dollars. And this is um, the CPA's contribution towards that. Uh, the Department of um, DCR, <laughs> Concert, DCR, thanks, um, is contributing 100,000 towards it because they did believe that preserving the vistas next to the rail trail was worth doing. Um, and then this year we're not going to, they're not recommending funding for the North Common. They think that could wait uh, another year to be further developed. The master plan for the community field, which everybody agrees it's needed, but that too, they didn't feel they had the money for it. And 80,000 for uh, Habitat, the house that would have been the one on Strong Street um, that we purchased the Hawthorne house. Uh, they didn't get the um, release on restoring, uh, that restoring that would be so expensive that they can't afford to do it, but they don't have permission from the state yet to tear it down and build affordable housing. So Habitat can't move forward on that. So that's, that's a report. What was the thing that housing, they were? I'm housing. going to ask you about housing it. Authority. Housing authority. The housing, housing, the housing authority. authority. That's not the one I'm thinking oh. of because it was something that we went from 30 back up to 60,000. MR. What hmm. the heck is MR? But uh, the no other river. recreation no field repairs. Thank you. That's, that's a shade thing. thing. That's, well, it isn't just a shade thing. There's a leak. It's an important that, shade thing. And the and there's fencing that needs mm. doing. And so when they decided that they were going to do this, they um, moved, increased the amount back up to the 60,000 mm -hmm. that was requested. Okay. The problem with the housing is that after uh, Mr. Jessup studied it very carefully, he's not sure that CPA money can be used for the project that was brought forward, which was for providing repairs to the kitchens um, which were in very bad shape, but because those, that housing um, units, those housing units were not purchased with mm -hmm. CPA money, he doesn't think this is legal. So what is happening at the moment is there's a request from town council to find out if we can do this, but the feeling was that we were walking a, on an icy. Thin ice. Yeah, <laughs> it was a little bit insecure, shall we say. So the way they were able to spend all this money is gonna be by bonding it, um, bonding par part of these um, projects. And the only problem with that, everybody was ecstatic with the things we did approve. You could just feel the air um, lighten when, when the vote went um, the way it did. The, the only issue is that every time you take more of the CPA money and put it into bonds, there's less to spend the following year. And so it's kicking the can down the road a little bit because if there are equally good projects next year, there's, it's, it's hard. But this is a good time to bond in terms of the interest rates. So that's, that's my big, much more lengthy report than I wanted. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from Ms. Stein? Ms. Brewer? I'm sorry. I will just ask Ms. Stein to take back to the committee, the CPA committee, um, one little person's concern about the Rock Farm project, mm -hmm. um, just in general. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. fascinating that DCR has decided that's worth preserving. Mm -hmm. That's certainly not been high on our conservation list of anything to do. And so it was, in fact, at one point considered a potentially viable place to build housing since we don't really seem to want to build housing anywhere in town of any kind, um, it's kind of irritating to see right. something else go to conservation. But that's a whole other, I'm just saying that often when we have these proposals come to town meeting, it's so obvious. Like we've been looking for this piece of green space to fit all together and then this all works so well and it's this great flow and 
but sometimes when people hand us money, it's kind of foolish not to pursue it as well. So um, an interesting little juxtaposition we have there. I would just ask the town manager to follow up with us later to let us know after this plays out with whether or not the Amherst Housing Authority project can be done with the money because I'm concerned because that was supposed to be matching money to block grant money. Block grant money we may or may not be getting and it's a huge project and if we don't get the block grant money or we don't and we certainly aren't going to get enough block grant money to do all of it without the CPA money then are we do we consider using joint capital planning? I mean, we have to do something. They just don't get anywhere near enough maintenance money from the various other sources and they apply for grants and yada yada. But I mean, when cabinets are falling off the wall and you don't have ground fault circuit interrupters, you kind of need to do these things at some oh, point. Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, where, who, who's, whose lap does it fall into next, you know, after all these right. other attempts have been made to fund it, so that we won't, we can't just say, oh well, and, and just not do it. What, okay. What will be the next It's getting step? late, so let's That's all I'm asking. try and move along. Thank you. Other questions or comments from Ms. Stein? All right, next reports. Ms. Brewer? <coughs> it's been really awesome. I haven't gone to a bunch of meetings because all my life is now focused on the regionalization of elementary schools, and I, I really don't want to talk about it, so <laughs> let's just move on. <laughs> you do have one big report you gotta give us on that. For Except those who we're having a meeting on Wednesday and things may change. So yeah, so we, we were all leading up to this vote on March 9th where we were going to decide what was going to be the thing we were going to continue to work on or were we going to continue to work on anything? Were we going to just say, oh, done with this, walk away? Were we going to look at a pre-K to 12 system? Were we going to look at keeping the seven to 12 system while changing its school committee composition and adding on a pre-K to six? And lo and behold, uh, it was determined at that meeting that the only progress we seemed to be able to make was to have a three-town K-6 with Leverett, Pelham, and Amherst. Shootsbury representatives indicating, although they personally may have been very supportive of the process, they did not feel the town was quite ready to be there yet. This was, of course, very frustrating for many people at the table, but that seemed to be where we ended up after four hours with a half-hour break in there at some point. Since that happened, there has apparently been another subcommittee, another meeting of, because you know, we're all these four towns which each have three member boards and their three member board got together since then and is rethinking their position and wondering if something has changed sufficient in their town that they could consider asking for reconsideration on our, at our next meeting, our very next meeting, which is Wednesday. We would have met sooner had we had the opportunity, but you know, there's, uh, it's kind of hard to get 12 people together in the same place. We worked really hard to have all of us there on the 9th. Not all of us can be there on Wednesday the 20th. So similar to old arguments we've had in the past at town meeting, you know, different set of people's here tonight. You know, when do you reconsider? When do you mm -hmm. make these kinds of decisions? So it's super complicated and it's super frustrating and I don't have no idea what's gonna happen. So yeah, so we thought we were gonna be moving forward with the uh, three elementary schools working together, but now we don't know what's gonna happen. But we know we'll be doing something, so yeah, there's that. Thank you for dealing with all of that. You're welcome. <laughs> that's, uh, that's been an amazing process. Yeah. Really Questions or comments from Ms. Brewer? All right, anything else from Ms. Brewer? No, no? That's, that'll do. This side of the table, anyone? I'm done. You're done, Over. Mr. Wolf? <laughs> Uh, let's see. I was going to add to the CPAC, but it's late, so I won't. Uh, Historical Commission took up the question of the rezoning of Main Street lots, which are your Article 40 uh, on the warrant. As you know, those are the lots at the corner of Gray Street and Main Street that we town had proposed to purchase with CPA funds before and didn't work out. The new proposal by Mr. Gadera, the owner, is to rezone them uh, from general residential to neighborhood business, uh, what he's going to do is uh, that would allow him to build more densely. So basically he'd build on one of the lots, the corner lot, rather than both of them, and would create a building there that could house Amherst Media, ACTV. So that's what's going there. The Historical Commission seemed sympathetic to the general intention, in part because it leaves the one other lot open, but did not take a position, and that'll take place next month. Uh, 28th, the Zoning Board of Appeals will take up the Historical Commission's response to the request about the 290 Lincoln Barn demolition. 
And then Design Review Board had interesting things, not just the usual signs, which are always fascinating and I enjoy very much, but what I call the cash cow, that's not its official name, uh, Mr. Gates, whom you know is working very close, who owns the carriage shops and of course has been a great patron of the, uh, sir, of the uh, homeless shelter through the Baptist Church, uh, wants to erect there, uh, or to allow it to erect on his property, a large cow sculpture made of recycled metal by local artist Camille Peters, about seven feet high and six feet long. It would have, it'd be a receptacle so people could deposit money inside uh, or they could have themselves pictured there and there'll be memorabilia you can purchase. The idea being that uh, counterfeit cow productions is making a film about homelessness in a university town and the money therefore raised would be a way of calling attention to the plight of the homeless and the, and the poor. And it sounds like a very interesting idea. So there'll be a large metal cow. Kids can ride on it. You can have yourself photographed there. It'll be lighted at night and coming, coming soon to a carriage shop near you. Fascinating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments from Mr. Wald? There's a frog in Northampton. There can be a cow. In a Our rabbit disappeared. We have to have something down there. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so for my reports, um, we talked all about safe and healthy. Um, so campus and community coalition, we pretty much covered that too. Um, I will just mention a, a, one other thing. I've got a document in the packet. Um, the second element of the document, this is called Some UMass Spring Community Activities, is the Walk This Way campaign, which you might have read about in the newspaper also. Um, I told you the campus and community coalition was uh, organizing itself into work groups to deal with very specific problems for the spring. So. One of those groups is the, the moving around group, walking around group, trying to deal with kind of the roving bands of, of kids who kind of migrate from place to place looking for some place to be. And they cause a lot of um, disruption in neighborhoods often. So, uh, so this group is working to get them to, particularly the, the very large crowds that are going back to Southwest, to try and get them to take a particular route. And so they're gonna be doing that by having a whole bunch of um, students and other volunteers uh, and uh, electronic signs from the Amherst Police Department, just trying to direct them. It's not, it, it's not like requiring, you know, there's not gonna be, you know, we're not gonna, you know, all join arms and prevent somebody from going down Fearing Street or whatever, but, um, you know, no phalanxes or whatever. <laughs> uh, but encouraging, you know, to folks to, to take a, a different route and they've kind of mapped out a route down um, Phillips Street that would take you through uh, into the uh, UMass parking lot that comes out at the end of Nutting Street that actually that, that's the back of the parking lot it fronts on Mass Ave but you'd be kind of going through that um, that back part they'll have the baby Burke UMass food truck there to kind of entice um, and so it would be kind of taking a less disruptive route to uh, to Southwest um, there, we're looking for volunteers to assist in this effort. This is 10:30 uh, p.m. to 2:30 a.m. on three nights. Uh, I will be there on both the Saturday nights, April 13th and April 20th. I'm skipping the Friday, April 5th one because you know we've got that Stan Rosenberg's Municipal right. Conference first thing Saturday morning. I thought I don't want to be up until 2:30 and then go to that at eight. But anyway, um, I strongly encourage you or anybody that you know, especially town folks. I think it's a it's a good thing to get involved with if you can stand it. I mean, this is not for everybody. I recognize that. But uh, but if you would be willing to do that, then let me know. And uh, I, I think it'll be fun. And I think uh, I think it's a it's a nice way to, to show real responsiveness to uh, neighborhood concerns over there. Um, as you probably read in the paper, they're actually looking, this will be something of a test to, to see if maybe this could be a route more for the future that would be more permanent, that maybe would be marked as was sort of a, uh, they called it the Minuteman Trail. So th they're just completely um, brainstorming at this point, but, but really thinking about what could be long-term solutions. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So uh, anybody wants to take part, you just let me know. Um, the other thing that's on that list that's not actually related to campus and community coalition, but it is uh, student stuff related to spring. This actually came out of a meeting that Mr. Musanti and I had with um, the Greek representatives from the Greek community a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe a month or so ago. Um, and. Uh, Olivia Pijanowski, uh, president of the Panhellenic Council, uh, emailed me to, to update uh, us on what they're doing. So what the uh, Panhellenic Council, which is the sorority council, and the interfraternity council have done is organize a neighborhood cleanup that's going to start uh, on Easter Sunday, actually March 31st, and then be every other Sunday in April 
and I've outlined on here the roads that they will cover. They're, so they're basically going to clean all of the litter off the streets and sidewalks on Phillips, Nutting, Lincoln, North Pleasant from Mass Ave all the way to Amity Street. I mean, that's all the way downtown. Uh, Fearing Street from North Pleasant to Sunset and the residential side of Sunset Ave. Uh, all of the different chapters have been assigned different quadrants of those wow. places to clean up. And, uh, and again, so, you know, we, we, t we talk about kind of the 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 negative impacts uh, that too few of the students make, um, if considering how we generalize about them, it's really such a such a small um, a small subset. But it's vast majorities of the students don't cause any problems at all, and more than that, are looking to find solutions. So the Greek community was really interested in trying to give back in a way that would be meaningful to the community. So we talked about kind of the whole litter concept and they really liked that a lot. They completely seized that and will run with it and uh, and I think that uh, it, they, they should really be praised for that great effort and much appreciated and uh, and we'll see how that goes. So so thanks very much to um, Olivia Pijanowski from uh, Panhell Council and, uh, and all the uh, folks in the Greek system for what they're going to be doing those weekends. That should be tremendous. And I think that's all I have to report on liaison stuff. Uh, open meeting law update. We hope you don't have any. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So there's, there's a thing in here. You can go to it if you want. She actually um, also issued some additional information associated with Sunshine Week, which usually there's a big write-up about in the newspaper. I'll see if there's anything of interest and let you know. Thank you very much. Feel free. Chair's report, chair's report, I have bad news, sorry. So um, last time I told you about an advocacy letter, you said, yes, yes, write it, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, that really hasn't happened yet, I apologize. So it's supposed to be two letters, it's supposed to be like one to our legislators and one to the public, and Mr. Musanti and I were gonna work on communication points and everything, it just that has not been that kind of a couple of weeks for that to happen. Um, but uh, but we think it's not too late, we're still gonna do it, and, uh, and we're really sorry, and if somebody would rather do it instead of us, then you could speak up also but <laughs> the goal <laughs> <Feel free. laughs> the goal is to do it and so I do apologize for the not, that not having been done yet so anyway that's where it is Miss Stein as a good little select board member I called every single one of those people and left a message excellent excellent awesome. thank you all right um, so that's all my stuff do we have other things yes, yes we, we still do. have more licenses more to deal with <laughs> I can make motions all right, so we are working with different versions of the motion sheet. So let's just, uh, before you start reading them, just say what they are and we'll make okay. sure Okay, well, we have a special liquor license for the senior pub night. Okay. We have a, uh, two at least at UMass. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. All right, so, so why don't I do on. those two? Yep. Um, I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license for a cash bar for the senior pub night at the Amherst College Keat Campus Center, Thursday, March 28, 2013, from 6 p.m. to 1 a.m., Charles Thompson, manager. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All right, that's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a special liquor license. No, I'm sorry. I move that the select board approve special liquor license applications for the University of Massachusetts for receptions to be held on the following events, dates, and times. Judy Bardwell, clerk, top of the campus, incorporated. Wine and malt, April 20th, 2013, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Fine Arts Center, Atrium, UMass Amherst. All alcohol, April 27th, 2013, 6 p.m. to 12 p.m. Recreation Center, UMass Amherst. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All right, and I have two taxi licenses. I move that the select board approve a new taxi driver license application for Peter Belden on behalf of Ambassador Taxi Company for the calendar year 2013. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve a new taxi driver license application for Russell A. Russo on behalf of Aaron's Transportation for the calendar year 2013. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And unanimous. then I have minutes which I have read. Shall I go ahead and approve them? Are folks ready to approve the minutes tonight? We've got two sets of yeah. minutes. Yes, no, minutes? Can we go for, can we approve them? Yes, yeah. okay, Ms. Stein. I move that the select board approve the minutes of February 11, 2013 
and February 25th, 2013 as amended, because I have some amendments. Uh, Ms. Reed. Second. Thank you <laughs> for the discussion. <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 That's and that's yes. all I As had amended it. or as? Amended, yes. As Sorry? Amended. Okay. As amended. And here, you can have the amendment. And Mr. Musanti also has a. Yeah, in your packet, you have a uh, citizen yeah. activity form from Robert Brooks, an applicant for yes. the Conservation Commission. And I would sure. ask the select board to uh, move to confirm my appointment of him to the Conservation Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2014. Second. Further discussion? Oh, Mr. Hayden. Has he been on the commission before? I'm, uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, no, uh, he's a retired uh, U.S. Forest Service, uh, excellent credentials. Uh, back in the 80s, he was uh, a chair in the green on the Greenfield Conscom. Okay, or maybe the He's, he's got a background, a good yeah, background. Yeah, no, he's, he's very impressive. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, that was moved and seconded, right, for the yes, discussion? And discussed. and discussed. All in favor say aye. 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 aye, that's unanimous. Okay, so we have covered every motion on the motion sheet that we need to cover, right. correct? Correct. We do not meet again until the 8th of uh, April, which is the night before the annual town election time. We don't usually meet, but we did agree to meet. Um, I'll just note we do have a liquor license hearing that night, as is mentioned on the uh, calendar preview. That's for Hickory Ridge Golf Course. Ms. Stein mentioned the adding the flag thing to that meeting, so we will do that. I'll notify the Rotary. Thank you. And uh, I think that's all. Does anybody have anything else that needs to be said before we go to Mr. Hayden? Then, Mr. Hayden. Now moves to adjourn. And without objection, this meeting is adjourned at 9.55. Thank you very much.